It's 8 o'clock on today. Coming up, rising tensions. A U.S. Navy destroyer shoots down three drones used to attack ships in the Red Sea. While in Gaza, Israel steps up its attacks. We're live with the latest. Then Liz Cheney live. The former congresswoman opening up in a new memoir talking Trump January 6th and the future of the Republican Party. Our exclusive interview straight ahead. Plus, at risk, Florence Pugh hit in the face by an object thrown by a fan. Coming up, her condition. And shining stars, Hoda talks with Oscar winners Julia Roberts and Mahershala Ali, joining forces for their new thriller. What was the experience like, Julia, working with this man? You know, there's just a poetry to the way that he carries himself in life and in art, in my experience. I mean, and he's so tall and his eyes are so <laughs> kind and... Very kind. How would you describe working with Julia? A joy. A joy. Just yeah. a joy. Yeah. A joy. And talking fame, family, and stealing the spotlight. Good Whatever. Company. He steals I, the I'm show. In good and you know I'm who else steals company. the show? Today, Monday, December 4th, 2023. Visiting today from San Diego, Greece, Illinois, Des Moines, Iowa, and Nashville, Tennessee. Here for my 40th. Good morning to our students at Franklin Elementary in Metropolis, Illinois. Sleep is so thin. On a mother-daughter trip through Texas, Missouri. Celebrating Ludwig's 81st birthday. Hi to our family waking up out west. In Pasadena, California. Sending love to our daughter Mary Kay. In Bogachetta, Mississippi. Hey now and pop up. We made it on the Today Show. We are back 809 with former Wyoming Congresswoman Liz Cheney, a staunch conservative who voted with Trump 90% of the time for most of her term. She broke from most of her party in the wake of January 6th, leading the charge against him on the House committee investigating the insurrection that day. And after losing her primary in Wyoming last year, she's been hard at work on a new book. It's out tomorrow. It's called Oath and Honor, a memoir and a warning. Congresswoman Cheney, good morning. It's good to see you. Good morning, Savannah. Great to be with you. No time for pleasantries after I read this book, you said in the starkest terms, we will be voting on whether to preserve our republic in the next election. You think this is a vote about whether or not we still have democracy in this country? It certainly is, you know, and, and Donald Trump has told us exactly what he will do. He will not abide by the rulings of the courts. Uh, he uh, will certainly appoint people to office whether or not they can be confirmed by the Senate. Um, he uh, has talked about using the military uh, in terms that uh, really are fundamentally un-American, uh, including here in the United States. So it's a very dangerous moment, and it's a moment for people to understand that, that that cannot be the path that we go down as a country. Just yesterday in an interview, you, you said fundamentally there's a choice to be made. You can't be both for Donald Trump and for the Constitution. You have to choose. Yeah. A vote for Donald Trump is unconstitutional, anti-American. Well, he won't, he won't support and uphold the Constitution. We've already seen what happened. Uh, he is the only president in American history who attempted to overturn an election, who attempted to seize power, to stay in power after he had lost. Um, and the reason that it, we didn't have a much more serious crisis was because there were people around him who stopped him, because there were people around the country, state officials, for example, who stopped him, who did not yield to the pressure that he put on them to change votes from Biden to Trump. Um, we won't have that safeguard again. And, and he's so dangerous. Uh, if you have a president who is unwilling to abide by the rulings of the courts, who's unwilling to uphold the Constitution, then there are no guardrails who can stop him. Uh, you've, said that can stop him. you've said we are sort of sleepwalking into dictatorship in the United States. Dictatorship. Is that what we yeah. would have if we reelect Donald Trump? I think it's it's a very, very real threat and concern. And, and I don't say any of that lightly. And frankly, um, it's painful for me as someone who, you know, has spent her whole life in uh, Republican politics, who grew up as a Republican, to watch what's happening to my party uh, and, and to watch the extent to which Donald Trump himself um, has, uh, you know, basically determined that that uh, the only thing that matters is uh, him, his power, his success. And um, that is not somebody you can entrust with the power of the presidency. It seems crazy to ask this and even crazier to fathom it. But do you believe if Donald Trump were elected next year that he would try to stay in office beyond a second term? I that he would never leave office? There's no question. 
Do you think no he would question. try to stay in power forever? Uh, absolutely. I mean, he's already done it once. And in fact, if you look at what he did in the run up to January 6th in terms of his pressure on the vice president not to count legitimate electoral votes, his pressure on the Department of Justice, on state officials, and then refusing to send help when the Capitol was under attack, um, he's already attempted to seize power. And he was stopped, um, thankfully, and, and for the good of the nation and the republic. Uh, but but he said he will do it again. He's expressed no remorse for what he did. What about those people who say, well, OK, fine, but there were checks and balances. We have co the two co-equal branches of Congress. We had a handful of individuals at the Justice Department. The former vice president refused to go along. So we'll be all right. Well, I think can, that can we survive know, another. Can the can America survive Donald Trump? That, that's a really the, the notion that we would be OK, I think, is is naive, because if you look at, for example, the Republicans who are in control of Congress today, um, they are, are collaborating with Donald Trump. Uh, you cannot count on a House of Representatives led by somebody like Mike Johnson to stop this president. You can't count on a Senate of Josh Hawley's and Mike Lee's to stop Donald Trump. I was going to ask you about that because I read this book. It was written well before the latest speaker's race. You devote many, many pages to this previously sort of unknown congressman, Mike Johnson, and you single him out as somebody who was, quote, destructive and who played a big role in misleading other members of your party. And now this Mike Johnson is Speaker of the House. What did you think when you saw this is who your former colleagues elected to the speakership? You know, I think that it is it's dangerous for the country. I think that um, many of them uh, did not understand in detail the, the role that he'd played. You know, Mike was a friend of mine. We served, we were elected together. Um, but, but Mike consistently throughout this post-election period um, was suggesting things that he knew to have no basis in fact, no basis in law, no basis in the Constitution, and advocating um, that, that members of the House get on board with helping Donald Trump to overturn the election. If we were to rerun the exact same scenario that happened in 2020, but happened in 2024 with Mike Johnson, with the Speaker's gavel, what do you think would happen? I, I think that it is, it is too dangerous to even contemplate going down that path, um, partly because they've all had practice now. Um, you know, what happened in 2020 and, and January of 2021, uh, in many ways, uh, they can look at as a, as a practice run. And, and they know now uh, what it would take, in fact, uh, to attempt to completely unravel the foundations of our republic. You said the Republican Party of today has made a choice, has not chosen the Constitution. Do you think Democrats, it would be better for Democrats to... to regain control of Congress in 2024? I think that this is a moment where a couple of things are really important. One is, as we talked about, Mike Johnson and, and the Republicans cannot be uh, in the majority in January of 2025. The House of Representatives may well be called on to determine the outcome of an election if it's thrown into the House. I mean, this so is that's, just crazy that's, stuff. You're Liz Cheney. Right. You were previously known as one of the most conservative members of Congress. You're the daughter of former Vice President Dick Cheney, and you're saying it would be safer for the country if Republicans weren't in control of the House. I think what we have seen is that you cannot count on this group of elected Republicans to uphold their oaths to the Constitution. But what this moment also requires, Savannah, is that people come together across party lines, Republicans, Democrats, independents, to stand for the Constitution. And that's why this election is, is so crucially important. You write that. You say every one of us, Republican, Democrat, independent, must work and vote together. So I'll put it to you very plainly. Will you vote for President Biden if Donald Trump is on the other side of the ticket. We don't know yet who the, the uh, nominees are going to be. Certainly, I hope that the Republicans don't nominate Donald Trump. But if uh, they do. But I will never vote for Donald Trump, and I will do whatever it takes uh, to make sure that Donald Trump is defeated. Including in a vote for Biden? I will do whatever it takes. Well, I, I know how deeply you feel about this. When you look at the train and you see some of these polls, and in a matchup between Trump and Biden, right now it is showing that Trump, it is Trump who wins, not just national polls, but in, in key battleground states. Do you wish that the Democrats had nominated someone other than Biden? Do you feel he is the best chance to defeat Donald Trump? I think we have to have the very best players on the field in order to ensure that Donald Trump is not elected again. And, and I think about this as a mother. I think about this as somebody who it very much is an open question whether our kids are going to grow up in a country that is characterized by a peaceful transfer of power. So and, is Biden that person, or do well, you think you know, there should listen, be someone else? We'll have to see what happens, and we'll have to see who is nominated. 
Um, but the single most important issue is making sure that Donald Trump does not have that that awesome power of the presidency again. Just real quick, I keep thinking when I was reading your book about the who is persuadable at this point. You call it a cult of personality on the Trump side. Okay, fine. So. If you're in the cult, you're not going to be voting for anyone but Trump. And then you have people on the other side, they'll vote for the Democrats. This is a sliver of people right. who think, OK, I may not have loved Trump. I'm tired of his antics, but I'm worried about the border. I'm worried about right. crime. Uh, and I think Biden's too old. What do you say to them? They think that, that a Trump vote is, you know, it'll end up being all right, maybe not pleasant, but it'll be all right. Yeah, I mean, look, I think that's a real problem. And I think that the challenge is to make sure that those people understand and recognize that a Trump vote is not acceptable. Uh, I hope that there are um, options and alternatives that reflect the important challenges that we're facing and that reflect leadership to meet those challenges. But that choice can never be Donald Trump because a vote for Donald Trump uh, may mean the last election that you ever get to vote in. And again, I, I don't say that lightly. Um, and it, it, I think is heartbreaking that that's where we are. But people have to recognize that, that a vote for Donald Trump is a vote against the Constitution. Real quickly, you have not ruled out running for president yourself. Do you envision something where you run with the Democrat and do some kind of unity ticket? I'm going to decide over the course of the next couple of months. Uh, and it will certainly depend upon where it looks like things are going with the nominations of, of both parties. But again, I think it, it is a, it's a moment where people have to be willing to put partisanship aside and say the future of the country demands that we, we uh, save the republic. And we're never going to get the chance to debate all the other really important issues if we allow Donald Trump the power to unravel the very foundations of our, of our Constitution. Congresswoman Liz Cheney, thank you for your time. Appreciate it. Great the book is called Savannah. Oath and Honor. It is out tomorrow. Back at 8.37, as Mr. Roker would say, best time All of the morning. Right, we have some good stuff for you this morning. First up, Beyonce. It is a renaissance at the box office. The singer's concert film opened at number one Nothing over the weekend, to according to estimates from point. AMC Theaters. Yesterday, a film by Beyonce raked in a whopping $21 million in North American ticket sales alone. Four of those were mine. Beyonce wrote, directed, and produced the project focused on her recent tour that wrapped up in October. And just like it was with, the, I think, the, the Swift concert, Nobody People go there, adults, kids, and they are, it's a concert. Yeah, it's yeah. fun. They Dance. get dressed up. Yeah. It's, just, it's just joy when we need it. Mm -hmm. All right. Next up, Ryan Reynolds, the actor's wife, Blake Lively, proves she's a certified member of the Beehive, sharing an inside look from the Renaissance London premiere. And this pic cozying up with bestie Taylor Swift. But of course, can Blake post anything on social media without her hubby trolling her? It's like their joke. People love it. So here it is. Ryan shared this edit showing off his Photoshop skills. <laughs> he swaps out Taylor for Blake, <laughs> for Travis Kelsey and his own grinning face. He joked in the caption, I feel like I should remember this. <laughs> so there you go. Next up, Florence Pugh, the actress is the latest celebrity to be hit by an object while on stage. This is an unfortunate trend that singers have been experiencing lately during concerts. BB Rexa, Kelsey Ballerini, Harry Styles, all struck right in the middle of their shows. This latest incident with Pugh occurred over the weekend in Sao Paulo, Brazil at a panel for the upcoming Dune sequel. She was posing for pictures, yes, uh, with co-stars Timothy Chalamet, Austin Butler, Jeez. and Zendaya. 
The object seemingly hit her, hits her square in the eye. Oh. So no statement from the actress, but we hope she's doing okay. And this unsettling trend dies down soon. Enough is enough. All right, next up, Jennifer Garner. She can act, she can bake, and she can dance. During Garner's recent trip to New York, oh. she visited our neighbors over at Radio City. It was all because her buddy Reese Witherspoon sent her a message requesting that she dance with the Rockettes. Do you want to see how she did? Yes. Yeah. All right, take a look. Oh, for sure. Wow. Right? That's everything. nothing she can't do. Good mm-hmm. stuff. If she had the little costume on, she'd put right in. All right, finally, Martha Stewart. A recent post on her Instagram is reigniting oh. an eight-year-old debate. I can't believe it's been eight years online. Over the weekend, Martha posted this picture with the caption, grandchildren were educating me about the dress. So we're going to do it again for Martha. I don't know how it's not blue and black. It's blue and black. It's white and gold. Are you trying to say that what you're looking at right yes. there is they, blue and black? It's blue what and black. Is black. white and gold. Did they ever? The did, top is black, and then it's a blue line, and then it's little did black Did they ever just explain? Oh I Are still don't know. It's me? golden white. It is it's golden white. Keenan, what Kenan, is that? Keenan, what color? No, blue, blue and gold. gold. There you go. Blue and black? Blue and no, gold. blue and gold. I don't see black. I see no one sees black. I no, see blue I, and gold. We he do. sees blue and gold. I it's think the you guys most might bizarre need... thing. Yeah. For the record, Martha also went with blue and black. Which Thank you, Martha. <laughs> Martha. That is right. bizarre. I could God. stare at that a thousand years and never see blue. I can't believe that. Kenan Thompson has been making us laugh for decades. He what? first made it. Yes. Oh. When he made a splash when he was just a little kid in the mm-hmm. 90s classic like D2, <laughs> the Mighty Ducks and Nickelodeons, <laughs> all that. Today, Kenan's the longest running member of SNL in its history, and he's pulling back the curtain. He's got a new personal project, a memoir. It's called When I Was Your Age, Life Lessons, Funny Stories, and Questionable <laughs> Parenting Advice from a Professional Clown. Yeah. All right. Hi. Hi. Okay, How are you, you, doing? you put morning. your life out there. I did. I had to tell the whole story from A to Z. Did you? How much of your life, your real life, is in that book? Um, I'm in a, a 99%. Yeah, I yeah. Think. it's like, you? It, it's a, yeah, it's all me. I mean, you were a childhood star. You started when you were five years old. And I there did. are many, many kids who don't t- live to tell the tale, or <laughs> at least professionally don't, yeah. to talk about how they made it to the other side. How were you Ooh, able. I brush the <laughs> hair. You... I'm looking at the back of my how, hair. <laughs> how were you able to um, navigate those waters baby. and wind up here? Look at you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I'm in close family, you know, I'm looking back at these pictures and that was like an era in, you know, College Park, Atlanta, you know what I mean? And like very, very close to my family. Are those kids all your age? 
Um, <laughs> they were my age because I was very short was for a long a time. Kid. Yeah, I was yeah. a little small kid. Did for a that while. bother you when you were little? No, it didn't yeah. bother me until like sports became a thing. Yeah. And everybody became like giants and I was still little. <laughs> well, when you're younger, you're trusting. And uh, you mm -hmm. were very trusting when you started off in your career and you were making some money and you had an accountant. I'm still very trusting. Okay, you know? so but but yeah, had, there was a, a it was you know, account. bad accountant yeah. or whatever. Kind of so thing. you talk about this in the book, which I think is interesting. Mm -hmm. You made your first million and the guy basically took it. Yeah, but I mean, I never saw it. So yeah. it was, you know, a process of like, Here's a debit card, you know what I mean? And like, make yeah. sure you do your little like so monthly did, budgeting kind of thing or whatever. And then all of a sudden, did you ever I wanted to make a big decision. It was gone. It was time. gone. Yeah. Did you ever confront him or whatever happened to him? Oh yeah, I confronted him. And mm -hmm. then, you know, he kind of just went into the wind or whatever, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, the biggest thing was like, you know, the IRS coming after you because they don't, you know, they don't necessarily have to deal with what the actual story is. All they want is yeah. the money kind of thing. Yeah, so, sure. That was tough, but you know, I made it through and by the grace back, of God. You went back to trusting again after this. this I'm guy? very trusting. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not everybody is a crook. You know. Uh, what I, mean? I yeah. think that's good. Um, we had you and Kel on the couch the other day because um, your do movie and all the great things, and I didn't know. Maybe everyone else did that. You guys had had a falling out that you that you talk about too in your book. Which this yeah. was this I was mean, for years. Yeah, it was more of a separation that kind of grew into you know the traditional terms of what a falling out is, what which happened? is like not a lot of communication. Yeah. Um, originally, it was just us, you know, kind of looking for our own individualism, yeah. basically, as adults and kind of just taking a breather from, you know, being a duo um, because we both came into the game as, you know, individuals and, you know, we were placed together because we worked so well together yeah. and all that. And um, yeah, it was just the journeys of being adults and then, you know, Time passes and more time passes, and it just became ridiculous. And You're we were like, like sometimes you whatever. don't even. Some, we didn't even know. You exactly. don't remember, we don't even why remember you were fighting. what it was. And then, you know, I apologize. He apologized. Whatever you made it was. The phone call. We played. I think I called and we played phone tag for like a day or something like and that. And tell or me about and the because when you have a falling out and you finally get in contact again, how was that? When phone you have call? a real friendship, yeah. it was five minutes into the phone call we were You're back. Back, back like, to It yourselves. was like what were we waiting on all this time? But like you know, you just never really know until you actually have that talk. Basically. And by the way, that's a good life lesson. I think a lot of people are in feuds and they don't even remember the genesis of it, and yeah. they're still not talking. And it's also you know time wasted, which is one of the biggest crimes I think you can do in sure. life. It's just sure. waste time, you know. So it feels so good to be back with my brother and like the movie's doing well. Yeah. We're so appreciative, you know what I mean? And like I mean, looking forward to the next chapters. You talk a little bit about your divorce, not much. Mm -hmm. Was there a reason why you didn't want to go there too much? Well, I mean, I also didn't really want to speak out of turn on people who aren't there to tell yeah. their version of the story sure, as well. Sure. So I just kind of told my perspective. Basically. And you talk about being a girl dad. And I can tell that's that's really the love of your life right there. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. They're, they're my daily focus. Outside of myself, but um, <laughs> <laughs> they are definitely my my sweethearts, and you know they're off to school this morning, so they're already in class. But mm. yeah, I love them. And um, Saturday Night Live again, you're the longest running cast member by 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 far. Yeah, it's, it's getting mean, up there. Do you ever <laughs> see yourself spending your Saturday nights anywhere else? Honestly, I don't really know. Like, what's more exciting when you know SNL is having a moment? Like. You know, Emma Stone last week was so dynamic <laughs> and so, so amazing. funny, right? And um, you know, it was just like incredible to watch a performer like that because she inspires us. I mean, we do a lot of characters and sketches and this mm -hmm. and the other, but she never half committed to anything. And I watched her read 50 sketches. Wow. Well, the SNL writers always say they love when you are in their sketch because they know even if the writing doesn't really hit the mark, your look will always do the trick. <laughs> that's, that's, the one, so? that's the one. That's the one. Keenan, good luck with this book. Good luck Thanks. with everything. Oh, good luck I to love you. you. Good luck I love to you. you. I love you too. All Thank right. you for having me. Again, this book is called When I Was Your Age. It's out tomorrow. For more about it, head to today.com slash books. Coming up next, another legendary performer, three-time Grammy winner Brad Paisley. He's got a new song off his upcoming album, but first, this is today on NBC. Yeah, Brad.
City Music Series on today is proudly presented to you by City. And we are back on a Monday morning. We got a treat. Brad Paisley is here uh, with us. Hi, Brad. Brad has Hi, certainly earned his place in country music history. One of the most talented and award-winning solo artists of all time. He's going to perform a song for us off of his highly anticipated new album called Son of the Mountains. All right, Brad, we're going to talk to you after the song, but take it away. All right. Wish me luck. Tell their lies by the bottle Without an ounce of shame A promise on a slip of paper Guaranteed to dull the pain We dug that mine a mile below Built up this little town Oh, and we're still digging holes But these are six feet down There's coal under the mountains And gold in them, they're pills If Well, these are good God-fearing people Just doing the best they can And if the devil's in the details Well, then hell's in milligrams For every family visitation Sons and daughters gone too soon The drugstore and the undertaker The only business is the boom There's coal under the mountains And coal in them they pay It's all broken dreams and plywood Up and down these haunted streets Even the bar where we all used to go I guess even whiskey can't compete But I believe we This morning on the third hour of today, the short list revealed from Taylor Swift to Barbie to King Charles. Our exclusive look at the nine finalists for Times Person of the Year. Then, speaking of Taylor, she wasn't the only star out for Sunday Night Football. Gymnastics goat Simone Biles cheering on her husband at the Packers versus Chiefs in a thriller that went down to the wire. Plus, a whole lot of trolls. 
I'm obsessed about trolls. The story behind this record-breaking museum where bright hair, big eyes, and nostalgia are all on display. And our holiday gift guide from comfy slippers to travel essentials. Picture-perfect ideas for everyone on your list today, Monday, December 4th, 2023. Live from Studio 1A in Rockefeller Plaza, this is the third hour of today. On a good Monday morning. Thanks for starting your week off with us. Good this morning. is the third hour of today. Craig, Dylan, Chanel, uh, Mr. Roker is on his way back from D.C. as mm -hmm. we speak. Hope you guys had a great weekend. How about you guys? How about you? It was a fun weekend. I wasn't at the White House, but um, <laughs> I was. Get that I know. A friend of mine, chat to Denora, um, she rented out a theater. And so all the girls, you know moms, we had the best time. I had all these kids in my pictures, so I didn't know if I could show other people's kids. So it was a great time. Um, and then this weekend we had a big holiday party. So a lot of kids stuff this weekend. So what was what was Clara's overall like feeling? It was you know? so fun. I just had never seen her. I put it on my Instagram where they all like got up in the front and did like this dance. I'm like, how do you, how do they know, learn these? Social time? media. <laughs> Social media. But, but here's the thing. You saw, you saw Beyonce twice. I then saw you Be saw the film. So you know how did what? the film compare? It was fantastic. She also gave you a lot of extra information. You know, a lot of people didn't realize she had a whole uh, issue with her knee a month before know. the show started. So Ooh. for her to be doing all those moves or you get to hear about Blue Ivy and how it was really tough for her to see all the tough criticism on social media and how she was able to be so resilient yeah. and come out strong. So it was just, it was good. You had a good Everybody weekend. left smiling. So let's talk about you guys. How about yours? We just had a, a weekend at home with the family. It's like, oh my gosh, we have to get our Christmas card picture oh, it taken. Is time, isn't it? So we threw the kids outside with their, you know, matching jammies, but we gave them a, a tangle of lights. Yes. Brian, of course, captured the whole thing the way he does. So Look he, at like, that. He just shot this beautiful little video of the boys just playing with this tangle of Christmas lights. That's You're going to have video. this forever. Yeah. And then they just, there was music playing. They got up, Aww. they started dancing. And it was, it, I mean, it looks like a real video. I can't wait to kind, see the holiday card. It, it's really cute. And now I have to like put it together and order right. it. Right. What a gift that you have a husband who's such an amazing I photographer. Thing. <laughs> I hope like you value the fish. A million talent. dollar oh, video. Yes. Yeah. It's, okay. it's like you, you pay to get something like that done. <laughs> yeah. exactly. We just have it on our phone. Yeah. All right. So let's talk about your big weekend. I don't know if it was that big. What? Uh, we, We're we not went all to hanging the, out at the White House. Well, we, went, we did go to the White House Christmas <laughs> party on Friday. Roker was there, by the way. I was there too. So this is Beautiful. Um, Quincy's dress is beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, you, you look very handsome. And you've got your South, what's the, the South the Carolina bow tie? It's a, it's a tie that's made of molten bird feathers. Well, of course. <laughs> um, and there, Lindsay really enjoyed all of the scenery. There are the Rokers. Beautiful. Uh, Alan Deborah. So it's there. all decked out with different scenes? It's, I've never been. It is amazing. The, the amount of, of time that is spent decorating the people's house for Christmas. Uh, Lindsay shot a lot of... Not like fish. I saw this video. She, <laughs> yeah, she, shot, she shot a lot of video. So I feel like we if you there. get the assignment to decorate the White House, you're going to give it you your best. It yes. Yes. So we did that on Friday, and then on Saturday, we continued our annual tradition in uh, Eastern Connecticut. We went and we cut down the Melvin family Christmas Yay. tree. Okay. So uh, there's there's the ritual. Is um, it a chainsaw or a hacksaw? I, I go old-fashioned, baby. You it's do old. a chainsaw? No, no, no. I mean, uh, uh, it's that's a lot of work. It is. Yeah. It is a lot of work. This year yeah. was the first year Delano was able to pitch it and help out, though. Okay, oh, that's good. So we oh, did that, fun. and we spent a lot of time talking about the new Melvin family dog. Did you get one? Not yet, no. But uh -oh. we, but, we did put it out there. But we, we, we talked about it. Okay. We're making progress. Big, small? That's where we're, that's where okay. we're having the I issue. I thought you posted a picture of a scoreboard. Hmm. Oh, we did. I, that's We lost our first basketball game. Oh, but, he uh, wanted to just... thanks, thanks for opening that wound again. <laughs> thanks for... Well, are coach, you the coach? Right? Yes, yes. Um, <laughs> it's the first game of the season. You can't win okay. them all. No. Yeah. They're there. Not even close. That whole resilience thing, it pays off. All right, well, it's a big week here because we are going to reveal Time's Person of the Year. Since 1927, Time has chosen the man, woman, group, or concept that had the most influence on the world during the previous 12 months. Here are some past covers. Well, this morning, we have an exclusive look at this year's shortlist. Shortlist for Time's Person of the Year begins with a trio of world leaders. First up, King Charles III. God save the king! His crowning moment came in May, after a decades-long wait for the throne, and at a moment of change for the UK monarchy. I shall strive to follow the inspiring example I have been set Russian President Vladimir Putin continued to wage war in Ukraine. 
Now in its second year after the full-scale invasion and Chinese President Xi Jinping, who is serving an unprecedented third term and solidifying his role as one of China's most powerful and controversial leaders. Next on the short list, 2023's biggest newsmakers. Sam Altman has made countless headlines in recent weeks for getting fired and swiftly rehired as CEO of OpenAI, the company behind ChatGPT, which is leading the AI revolution. Jerome Powell, chairman of the Federal Reserve, also on the short list. Powell faced with the daunting task of managing record inflation here in the U.S. Next, the Trump prosecutors, the team that led the first ever indictment of a U.S. president in our nation's history. Trump is facing more than 90 charges across four separate cases. The short list now moves to Hollywood and the strikers that brought the entire industry to a standstill. Actors and screenwriters were on strike for most of the year before reaching a deal pushing for better pay and working conditions. Also on the short list, Hollywood's newest, It Girl. Hi, Barbie. The live action movie was the highest grossing film of the year, earning $1.4 billion and causing an explosion of wealth, all pink everything. Then finally, Are you ready for it? global superstar Taylor Swift. The Grammy Award winner has had a monumental year, re-released albums, record-setting streams, and her Eras tour, on track to become the highest-grossing global tour of all time. So there you go. You have a lot of options. You can head right to today.com now back to make your prediction for who you think will be chosen this year. And here's the deal. You don't have to wait for long because we will reveal the time person of the year and yet another Today exclusive on Wednesday morning. And then tomorrow we will have here on the third hour the exclusive reveal of Time's 2023 athlete oh, of the year. That's interesting. So Imagine if it's like Travis Kelsey and Taylor Swift. Oh, I see. In like two different. There he won't yeah. be there. I don't. Know, I don't know if he's going to be the athlete of the year. But yeah. He's probably had a better year. Than, who do you think is going to be the person of the year? I kind of think Taylor Swift. Yeah, I just think it's just. Like think of how many times she has led the the news. Yeah. Yeah. Well, especially even, here on the Today Show. Yes. And then you think of all the politicians we've named and the royals. They all also wanted to be. Yeah. <laughs> at that the world. concert. I mean, everybody's world. wearing the bracelets. Yeah. It's true. like it's oh, taken true. over. Yeah. We'll see. Yeah. All right. So, okay. Well, we uh, obviously mentioned Taylor Swift is on the short list. Well, she made an appearance. See, here we go. She made an appearance at Sunday night football in Green Bay, of course, cheering on Travis Kelsey and the Chiefs. But she wasn't the only famous fan there because the Packers have a celebrity super fan of their own. <laughs> NBC's Kaylee Hartung is live in Chile, Wisconsin to take us inside the game. Kaylee, good morning. Hey, good morning, guys. So the Chiefs winning streak with Taylor Swift in attendance has come to an end. But when you come here to Green Bay, you understand why this place is a bucket list kind of trip for so many sports fans. Packers fans, they know a little something about hospitality and upsets. Star power stepping out for prime time at Lambeau Field. Oh, there she is. The Chiefs bringing a certain good luck charm to town. Karma's the guy on the Chiefs. Do you think Taylor Swift can help Will Travis Kelsey to another win? Maybe. Maybe. I mean, she does move mountains. You can be a Packers fan and also a Swift Yes, yeah. always. <laughs> Taylor Swift fresh off Beyonce's film premiere in London, making the trek to the frozen tundra, arm in arm with Patrick Mahomes' wife, Brittany to cheer on Kansas City and boyfriend Travis Kelsey. Complete to Kelsey. But cheese heads were looking to shake it off Earlier with support Simone from Biles. a golden we'll girl of their own. Olympic champion Simone Biles on hand to support her husband, Packers defensive back Jonathan Owens. Show me the game day fit. You got the 34. I do have the 34. I have the Owens. What do people who have never been to Lambeau before need to understand about what makes this place so special? The energy, the hype, the fans, they're ride or dies. They'll do anything and they're so dedicated and they're just, it's, it's such a special and a unique stadium. The superstars, just two of the more than 81,000 fans rolling in for the big Sunday night football matchup. Bucket list stadium, most iconic stadium in the NFL. To experience game day in Green Bay. <laughs> and keep the Lambeau tradition alive of selling out every home game since 1960. How much achieved 
Chiefs Kingdom turned out for this one? A lot. There's a reason it's Chiefs Kingdom. But they're going to be sad tonight after we, we win this game on them. A house divided between this husband and wife. How long have you been looking forward to this game? 12 years. <laughs> Super Bowl MVP Patrick Mahomes making his debut at Lambeau. He sacked. Big hit. Mahomes throws a pick. But it was a love story for the Packers. Love throw. Enzo Watson. Oh, did he catch that? Quarterback Jordan Love owning the night. He's got the duh Sunday night football, man. It feels great. And with so many eyes on Taylor and Simone, you could not have scripted the end of this game any better. You had Taylor's boyfriend going up against Simone's husband in the end zone. It looked like Jonathan Owens might have shoved Travis Kelsey a little bit there, but on a Hail Mary, they don't throw a flag there. If there were any tears from Chiefs fans here in Green Bay, they would have frozen. Craig, I hope there weren't any tears in your house either. Oh, this Sorry about that, man. Del Delano was not excited about it, but Kaylee, you you're very diplomatic there. There should have been a flag on that play. But not everybody agrees. There should have been a flag on that play. <laughs> Mason, what do you think? No flag? No flag, <laughs> see? Who asked you, Mason? Anybody? <laughs> Mason says this. Thank you, Kaylee Hart. Did you guys see the Pats game? The pa are they still I'm playing? I'm kidding. I'm kidding. The seriously. Pats are still playing. Oh, seriously, it's been a bad, it's yeah. a bad run. All right. All right. Just ahead. <laughs> the holiday season, buy the numbers, the gifts, the decorations, and which holiday movie people are going to be watching on repeat. I think I know the answer for you. For you. Then later, <laughs> we're going to pay a visit to a museum where there's nothing but trolls. That's right, just trolls. We're also going to meet the woman behind that record breaking collection when the third hour of today, including Mason's analysis of football over the weekend, <laughs> comes right back. It's the last time I ask you. <laughs> feeling festive this morning with a special holiday edition of our series by the numbers breaking down everything from gifts to movies nbc news business and data report a data reporter that's <laughs> data, like a data data reporter data yeah. reporter that's, that's legit whatever you want to say it is, i mean no, can you I got imagine being a, a data reporter that's like <laughs> yeah but i got a lot of numbers out here I know you know? You do. So, <laughs> so let's get started, <laughs> yeah, let's get started. <laughs> okay first and foremost it's not the holidays without the feast no it's not and the first number i've got for you is 93 percent. that's how many will share candy and chocolate over these holiday season, according to the National Confectioners Association. So if you have a candy company, this is your time. This is your time, this is your time. But again, sharing, right? Sharing yes. is caring. You wanna not, not hoard everything for yourself. 55%, uh, <laughs> by the way, say they eat the straight end of the candy cane of first. I say well, absolutely. I, but 45% yeah. apparently do the hook. I mean, that's like, so why hook? would you do the hook? I don't know, unless you're like a fish, right? Okay. I mean, it doesn't make any sense, but look, <laughs> a majority this? have it, right? 12,000 latkes are actually shipped from Cat's Deli wow. in the Lower East Side, where wow. I live, by the way. So. Let's go, Cat's okay. Deli. That's a lot of lockers right <laughs> yes, there. And then lastly, 23% say fruitcake is the worst gift Only 23%? Well, no, no, 23% say fruitcake is the worst. Uh, other people oh, said like I a see. gift card. I have so. never had a fruitcake that I thought was my delightful. Theory is you've got good same, friends. <laughs> yeah, my, my theory is it's the same fruitcake that's circulating. Because it's so, no so hard. It, they what? just pass it along. All right, next. Else. Okay, yeah. so let's talk about, you know, obviously the tree, the decorations. Yeah. We have the goat of trees The goat right here. And that's the first stat that we have here. 50,000 lights. That's how many are on on the oh, Rockefeller nice. Center tree. I haven't counted each and every one of them to yes, verify, but that's the number that we have there. Okay. Uh, by the way, as far as fresh trees, a lot of people going out to try to put that, you know, but they want the balsam, they, you know, that balsam sure. smell in their, in their house. 25 million fresh trees are sold annually, according to the wow. National Christmas Tree Do Association. We plant, surely we're, we're replanting these, I right? would hope people are. Because that's yeah. a lot. Or okay. you go artificial. Okay. Uh, also, we have some world's largest stats here. 36 feet, that is the world's largest menorah, and 30 feet is the world's largest canara for Kwanzaa, okay. uh, which has seven candles in the lead up to uh, that holiday.
holiday. So pretty big. Can't fit that in your the house. Data reporter. Yeah. Keep there you go. Right. Yeah, more data. I'm more glad data. we're doing this one because a lot of people this time of year like to give back and give to others. Yeah. So uh, in terms of giving 1.3 billion, that's the stat for how many holiday cards are sent annually, according mm. to Hallmark. Although I feel like anecdotally, there's been fewer cards going out. But as I do of feel late, like this adds up when you take your picture, you know, for course, a holiday card and you photos, send out 200 at a time. You send out a mass. Yeah. yeah. So that, that kind of adds up. But also want to talk about charitable gifts as well. 30% of charitable giving giving is done in December. Mm. There's obviously the giving mood, so it's a pretty big month uh, for that. 85% of Americans are buying gifts for their loved ones. And then the 1890s is a very interesting stat I didn't know. That was the origin of the white elephant swap parties. Wow. It was first mentioned in a newspaper in Ohio. And everybody so, just hopped and on everyone board. started hopping on. Cool. So awesome. shout out Ohio. So, you're cool. so a Trevor, tre treasure trove of information. I've got morning. the numbers for you, Craig. So holiday entertainment, a lot of... Families spend a lot of time watching movies, watching shows this time of year. Give us some of those numbers. Yeah, so $512 million, that is the record amount that a holiday movie grossed. That was The Grinch in 2018. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Um, and also some other movies for you as well. Elf, obviously very iconic. Classic. 20th anniversary <laughs> this year. Uh, and Home Alone. I mean, obviously, huge watch classic. Watched over the yeah. weekend. 34% yep. of Americans rewatch Home Alone. So it's a favorite to uh, pop back on the TV, even if you've already seen it. The number one holiday movie, though, a classic, It's a Wonderful Life. I'm a, also Never a banking reporter, so, you know, I'm a big fan of yes. that movie as well. And then, of course, the number one holiday song. This is not a surprise to anyone. Mariah. All I want for Christmas is you, the Christmas queen, Mariah Carey. Uh, what about the big we, number? We do have a big number. Yeah, we do have a big number. It is 62%. 62% is the number of Americans that think that Die Hard is a Christmas oh. movie. I see. Which is no, whole, it's not. It's, sorry, it's not a Christmas uh -oh. movie. Yeah. Sorry. That's actually shocking to me. I'm right, 38% part of that Well, group. it's the same with Godfather. If there's a Christmas scene, it's a Christmas movie and can be watched on Christmas. Are you with Al now on that I, one? No, I've always Well, it's kind of like, is, like, is a breakfast <laughs> taco about the time you eat it or what's in it? <laughs> what's in it? I think that that kind of, your answer to that would similar... determine whether or not you think Die Hard is What is Brian Johnson? I don't think it's a Christmas movie. Just because there's Christmas like event in it. I think of it as a Christmas scene. You can watch it on Christmas. Right. Well, Terrible right. well Brian, thank you. <laughs> All right, coming up, it's, an, it's a museum really it's unlike any other. Nothing like you've ever seen. The story behind this record-setting collection of trolls that all started with one doll. And then later, some bright ideas for everyone on your holiday list. For your friends who are always on the go, maybe your friends who prefer to stay at home, we've got you covered when the third hour of today comes right back. Welcome to today. Every day. We are adding to the star power in our studio. The biggest names, only on today. See, we're coming in this early, right? Everybody, it's today. Like I won the lottery. How do you feel at this age, this stage? Liberated. We're just getting started, folks. Anal stuff with us now. The boys are back in town. The boys are back in town. It's a miracle. This has been fantastic. Everything and everyone you're talking about, only on today. Check out your old outfits. Puffy jacket? Puka shell necklaces? Denim tuxedo? Did you have frosted tips? Ah! <laughs> Look at you, you were so cute, I love it. <laughs> that is a clip from the latest Trolls movie, Trolls Band Together. They are back on the big screen, and this morning, we are paying a visit to a museum where those little dolls take center stage all year round. NBC's Jesse Kirsch visited the Troll Hole Museum. This is the definition <laughs> of see it to believe it, guys. Good morning. If you're scrambling to get your holiday shopping done, here's possibly an idea for the kids. 
trolls years ago. That's what one woman got for Christmas. Then she started collecting those classic childhood dolls, and she never really stopped. Now this Ohio woman has so many trolls, they've all teamed up for a world record. You've probably seen their wacky hair, wide eyes, and smirking faces. But even if you're familiar with these pint-sized iconic trolls, odds are you've never seen this many under one roof. This room is probably the most densely populated troll community on planet Earth. I would agree with that, yes. Welcome to the Troll Hole in Alliance, Ohio, home to the Guinness World Record for the largest collection of trolls, officially 8,130. Owner Sherry Groom says even if two trolls look the same, at least one feature has to be different to count. So pretty much everything we're seeing is unique in some way. Sometimes the eyes, sometimes the hair color. And sometimes the unexpected. Is that a Playboy bunny? That is Playboy. Is it fair to say for you at this point that trolls are an obsession? Yes, I'm obsessed about trolls. I'm paranoid someone has more than me, and I'm grandiose that I'm a troll queen. Groom's passion dates back to childhood. I'll start it with that right there. There was my very first troll doll that I got when I was five years old for Christmas. Something about the trolls in the folk and the fairy tales, and then the dolls represented that. So it wasn't just like a Barbie or a Cabbage Patch. The trolls had a history. Eventually, Groom wound up buying in bulk. I had a row of trolls and a shelf, and then it became a whole room. And once it became a whole room, I'm like, mm, do you need any more trolls? Look at that, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle trolls, skateboarding trolls. But this place is about way more than just all of these dolls. They've got backpacks and T-shirts and towels and a sleeping bag. This place is all trolls. Including other dolls that might not look so familiar. Groom says everything adds up to around 40,000 pieces, making Alliance Ohio home to more troll memorabilia than people. You will feel the energy of the happy-go-lucky trolls in the museum. It's a happy place. Groom says each year this happy place draws about 2,500 visitors from around the world. Guests put pins here. You can see Ohio's very densely filled out, but you can see the different countries up there. Finland, Sweden, Japan, China, Australia, India, Iran, Afghanistan. All visiting this small town about 60 miles outside Cleveland. You just got married. We did. <laughs> Why did this have to be part of the honeymoon? We saw it and thought that we would be remiss to miss the opportunity to come see the giant collection of troll dolls. Absolutely. It's insane. It's overwhelming. It's, it's, it's so much. It's so cool. How many times have you been here? Uh, eight. Been here eight times? Yes. What keeps bringing you back? I host exchange students and always looking for something unique to show them here in America. Come on, guys, it's time! And now with trolls dancing across the silver screen, Broom says another generation of kids is joining the troll fan club. How much of a bump did huge. the popularity go? Huge, huge popularity because you have three generations that love trolls from the 60s, the 80s, and again now. Why is this something people should see with their own eyes in person? So this is the only place in the world with this pile of trolls. It defies explanation. You can't explain this to anyone until you actually come here and physically feel it. Like oh, I said, you go. you're going to have to see it to believe it. We should mention the Trolls movies are made by NBC's parent company. The museum is open throughout the week. And if you go at certain times, you can even see Queen Poppy, our producer, there Will. You right, guy. His kids are big fans of the movie, so <laughs> he told me she's a, obviously a key player. When I was little, I had like a collection oh, on yeah. my dresser. And I, I remember I had those earrings, the you know the thing that went on the end of your pencil. And it was just fun All to the see. Things. It's nostalgic. Yeah, and you should it's nostalgic. go and see the troll hole. And I bet th <laughs> there would be some that I would. You should go to the troll hole. There you go. Jesse, yeah, thank, Jesse you. thank you. Thank you so much. All right, coming up, our holiday gift guide. Something for everyone left on your list. Picture this. You can finish your shopping today. We're going to help you out. And then later, we are learning about the benefits of low impact in a start today workout that you can do right at home. You can get up get and ready. do it with us. Do it with us. We'll be right back.
Oh, we're back now with today's holiday gift guide. And this morning, we have some ideas to make everyone on your list a little merrier. Here with those gift ideas, Patrice J. Williams, an affordable lifestyle expert and author, looking fly on looking a dime. Looking fly on a dime. Fly. I'm here yeah. for us. That's okay. how we do it. Always good to have you. Great to hear you. Thanks, here. thanks, Thank thanks you. for coming. Let's start with these duffel this is bags. Cute. Really duffel cute. Duffel bags. So for people who want to travel and be organized, this I is cow pack. This is their Luca duffel. This is a really popular item, but it's functional. It has yeah. nine pockets. Oh, wow. Yeah, like internal, external pockets, really deep side pocket Comfy. is what, right. It's really comfortable. Yeah, Material is water resistant, but also scratch resistant. I love it. So this is going to be really durable and keep you organized when you're traveling. And it looks yeah. like it comes in lots of different colors. It does, too. like more than 12 colors. Oh, wow. Oh, very cute. <laughs> okay. Coffee maker does cold and regular brew? Cold and regular. So for people who are used to cold brew, you know it can take 12 to 24 hours. This makes cold brew in less than six minutes. Ooh. Less than six minutes, or you can just brew regular hot That's coffee great gift. Mm -hmm. in three minutes. And it also does like different strengths. So if you want regular, is it hot or, or is it no, just regular coffee oh. ground. Right. That's it's awesome. really compact as well, multifunctional, and affordable. So if you don't have a lot yeah. of counter space, this yeah, would be this perfect. Is, this is perfect for small spaces. This, I love. This this is, like, we love this one, right? Eating, right? Yeah, right. So you can put that on. So it's ergonomically designed. The arms are bendable. Oh, Turn the light on on the left. You can lay down and do oh, yeah, right. on the, where you need. On the right. Yeah. Sorry, right. Yeah. It's focused. <laughs> so you can really light. bend it. Exactly. Yeah. Focus yeah. light. Three different levels oh, and three different really colors as well. So if you want a blue light when you're reading in bed, yeah. but something else. So you don't have to have a whole. Yeah. You don't want to have to have a whole light. Stand light on. Exactly. That's not too convenient. <laughs> Exactly. Really, what was that? Got to demonstrate all that? the different levels of it. Yeah. You but know, there's three different levels. Show. There's a Zoom on the camera. If they wanted that shot, right. they could have gotten <laughs> yeah, it. Exactly. Just making it easier. That's all. Just making it so much so easier. So these are cute. Okay. They can be inside and out, right? Inside and outside. So durable sole. Got a lot of grip to it. And these are actually like less than $65 right now. So they're on sale they're for so men, comfy. women, unisex. Yep. So this is the shearling. Super soft, moisture wicking as well, and it's got the memory foam on the inside, so really comfortable. Comfy. Too. Water yes. resistant. Water resistant. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. What's the story on these alarm clocks, Patrice? So, you see all these different colors here. So instead yes. of just setting the time for your alarm, you can also choose your color as well. Fun. So 30 minutes before your alarm goes off, the color gradually gets brighter. So it's a way to ease you into waking up. Instead of having a loud alarm clock, you can also choose nature sounds as well. So oh, wow. instead of using your phone and being like very jarring and having those loud sounds, this is something that's much more. Oops. <laughs> I know you. I'm just <laughs> pressing buttons now. So it's got the sounds and everything. To but it. that's so we very nice that. to wake yes. up to. Yeah, of like, it eases bah, you bah, up. Bah, yeah, bah. instead of like being really loud. Yeah. You can okay. also set your uh, uh, alarm on your phone to applause. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, read, I read that too. I read yes. that in a weekend. Here, here, that, Greg. Here, here. Thank you. Like, I'm awake. I'm awake. We all need to wake up like right, that. This is cute. So finally, so this is like an old school style camera, but it prints photos out instantly. Ooh. But the really great thing about it is, like you see, we've got some photos here. Prints in less than a minute. But also, you can change the filters on it. You can oh, add borders great. to it. Nice. Right. So it's a really great way to play around with your photos. Prints out in less than a minute on two by three. I know you can like literally snap a photo, right? Really cute. <laughs> right. You know the problem you have to teach your kids not to waste the paper. Yeah, that is true. true. But you can also the save the photos to a gallery, so you don't have to print everything oh, out. Oh, that's good. So you don't have to print it all that's out, good. and then it slides closed and open, so that also protects the lens as well. That's really that's a good. Cool, right? Did you print out a picture? I'm sure we got some pictures it right says here. Printing right now. Yeah, I don't know where it comes out. It comes out from the side, right there. Okay. And then you got it all in. Patrice J. Williams, thank you. Thank you for having me. It's a great idea. Thank you. By the way. If you would like more information on any of these products, you can check out our website, today.com slash gifts. All right. It's still printing. Still to come, the lowdown on a new start today workout that you can do without putting a lot of strain on your body. Then later, don't just yank it out. It's, no, let it's it do a Polaroid. Thing. Now you messed up the whole thing. Then later, I'm sharing one of my family's sweet holiday oh, traditions, an easy baked tart with a secret ingredient. Mm. We'll, put you we'll be right back. Look at this picture. See? Everything. See that line? That's where Craig yanked it.
All right, it is time for a Monday morning start today workout. When it's cold outside, it can be tough to stay motivated, certainly tough to want to go outside. So this is a great low-impact workout you can do anytime, anywhere, right in your living room. Here to show us how is founder of Le Sweat, Charlie Atkins. I like Le Sweat. Good morning to you. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Absolutely. Good morning to all of you guys. Before we get started, you have a special announcement to make. <laughs> yes. I am pregnant. Oh, pregnant. Oh, oh. Wait, is this like the big announcement? This is the, the big announcement. The yes. family? Yes. Uh, no, that we told them okay. ahead of time. Okay. Oh, we couldn't do that to them. Oh, this um, is so cute. Yes. Yes. But we did just announce yesterday, that's my husband, Chris, and our future. Is this your first? It is our first. I'm a first time mom. Oh, first time mom. So, Congratulations. working out so while, while pregnant has been very. Been yeah, right. you have to change things up a little bit. A little bit, yeah. A little bit, yeah. All right. Well, I haven't so, had it changed up too much yet. Yeah. But. Yeah. So, low impact workouts are a good thing. Yeah. So, early on in the pregnancy, everybody's like, low impact, low impact, low impact. Right. And so, it was good for the joints. You know, it's great to get the heart rate up without doing a ton Let's of jumping. It. So, there okay. are benefits to yes. the body. And my friends are here to help me. And you say low impact doesn't necessarily have to mean easy either. No. Oh, okay. No. Um, you exercise. can actually increase the intensity by grabbing heavier weights. So let's just grab a solo uh, weight for now. And we're going to be doing what I like to call fun cardio with a little bit of arms. And it's just a press jack. So you're just going to be pressing the weight overhead, stepping one foot out to the side, and then the other. Okay. If you want to increase the intensity, you could always jump if you wanted. But if we are doing low impact, right. you could just step out. So that's out. what makes it low impact. You're always keeping a foot on the floor or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Okay. okay. All right. Exercise this, one. This Easy enough. Would work Easy peasy. After a while. Yeah, it gets it, it catches up to you. Yeah. Like, okay. Uh, so next. next exercise, we're actually going to be using the chair. So if you have sensitive knees, or if squat your squat form isn't fantastic, and you want to work on it, a squat is basically getting in and out of a chair. So we start in a rack position, and then all we do is we stand up out of our chair, press overhead, and we're going to add a little arm action again. We'll do tricep extension. Ooh. Yeah. Okay. Nice today. Bring it back down, okay. and then we bring ourselves right back down. So if you wanted to make it more challenging, you could lose the chair, or you could go up in weights. Okay. Yeah, this is this one we feel. Let's do one, right? Just because. Yeah. Let's <laughs> go good. balance ourselves out. Yes. Okay. I got okay. two more exercises for you. Uh, next one, we're going to be doing all these trainers. We know everybody always neglects the posterior chain, the backside. So we're going to be doing a kickstand RDL, also known as a Romanian deadlift, into a bent over row. So left foot forward, right leg back. You're going to trace your front leg like uh, you're painting it with a hip paint. You're going to row, elbows to the sky, spread the chest, release, and then stand up by pressing through that front leg. Mm -hmm. So deadlift, single leg, working on the booty, hamstrings, Good back. Booty. Oh, it's all going into yeah. that left leg. Yeah. And all of these exercises, as you can see, are compound. So we're doing a ton of joints, a ton of muscle groups, giving it a big bang for our sweaty buck. That's good. Okay. Less okay. sweaty buck. Yes. yes. Uh, final exercise that I have for you today is no chair. Weights are with us. All we're going to do is we're going to have weights down at the side. This is what I like to call standing burpee. I do not like burpees, but I will yeah. do squat curl press any day, all day. Okay. So we're just going to squat down, stand up, bicep curl, press overhead. Okay. Right back down. Mm -hmm. Reset. Oh. Yeah. Okay. So, How are you guys doing back there? You good? That is way better than a burpee. This is way better than a burpee. Yeah. Um, you don't even have to get down on the ground. And again, these are all great for the joints. It's a good way to get the heart rate up. You're doing a ton of muscle groups. So, like I said, big bang for your sweaty. Yeah, Thank you, Charlie. I will out. say this whole the Start Today community, it's made me realize you really can't do a lot of things at home. Yeah. Yes. You don't need a lot of gadgets. No. Good stuff. Thank you. And by the way. Congratulations again. And congratulations. congratulations. Thank you so much. Keep it up. It's yeah. so And thank you guys as well. I always feel like you guys do thank all this to get all dressed and... You know, I want you to have some love. Yeah, all right. Well, you can join the Start Today community for more workout ideas, motivation, and more by scanning the QR code on your screen or going to today.com slash start today. In true today show fashion, we work out and then we eat. That's, right. <laughs> That's what we do. Up next, it's cooking with cow. We're making one of our family's favorite holiday treats with a secret ingredient, and we also had a special helper in this one. Oh, all right back. oh. there he is. What's up?
Good morning, everybody. Here's what's happening in your neck of the woods. Oh, you deserve to be celebrated. Way to go, Reynolds. Oh, Al. Al, you're all of our heroes. Yeah. Y'all love Al Roker. <laughs>《Baked Treat》for the holiday season with a special ingredient that makes for a very extra flaky crust. Okay. Take a look. It's another edition of Cooking with Cal. What are we making today? Raspberry tart. Raspberry tarts. And where are all our ingredients? I don't know. Where do they go? We just had an egg and a tart. Well, that's not enough to make tarts. Yeah. I'm going to get our ingredients, okay? Where are they? Why are they there? Because we got to keep them nice and cold. Freezing cold ingredients. What? I'm gonna cut this up into cubes. You wanna help me here? Okay. Once we touch this butter a little bit, yeah. I'm gonna put it back in the fridge to stay cold. In here, we have gluten-free flour. Yeah. You know, but this will work just fine with regular flour. Yeah. Okay, but we're gonna obviously use gluten-free flour. Let's add some sugar. And what do you think this is? Salt. Salt, perfect. We're gonna get back out that cold butter. Mommy, when did we start doing cooking with like that? Years ago. How old was that? Um, like three? Mm -hmm. Okay, so dump all this oh, in. Two. Yeah, two. Two? Yeah, that's still top. You know what this is? No. Mm -hmm. A butter masher? It is kind of a butter masher. It's actually called a pastry cutter. I so I'm gonna show you what we're gonna do. I'm gonna hold it here. And mash it. We're not gonna mash it, we're gonna cut it. Okay, we wanna keep some clumps, so we go like that. And you could also do this with your hands if you don't have a pastry cutter. We're trying to make nice flaky pastry dough, right? So to keep it flaky, I've got a couple tricks. Let's add the apple cider vinegar. We're gonna cook with a little bit of vodka because, remember we're trying to keep the pastry nice and flaky? Yeah. So the alcohol in the vodka is gonna burn off in the oven, and we're gonna have a nice flake pastry crust. But it's still a little dry. Not all of it. Wrap this in plastic wrap. Okay. Wait, hold on, we don't wanna wrap it too tight, so I'm gonna show you what. Wrap it kind of like that, because I want to press it down. And then we'll pop that in the fridge for about a half hour. I think yeah. we should ask for some help. Yeah. Okay. Oh. <laughs> Even pieces. So cut that down the middle. Okay, two more cuts. Flour for your station. Okay. Press it out to make a little circle. Flip. And now I'm going to give you the rolling pin. And you want it to be thin, but not too thin that it falls apart. Nice and even. That looks good. I'm going to take a little bit of this. Put it right there. What is it? This is raspberry jelly. Technically jam. Because this is our filling. So pick your favorite jelly or jam or preserves to go in the middle. Take one side. Okay. That's hard. Grab this yeah. side. Flip it over. And make a little pocket. And then we're gonna take these edges. Doesn't have to be pretty. Crimp this all together. So we make a nice little seal. Oh, you can mash it for me. Whisk it up. This is called an egg wash. We're gonna brush this egg on. wash. Now, we're gonna take a little sprinkle of sugar. Just a little. Because I don't know how to do it. Hey, I bet you could if you tried. A sprinkle. Beautiful. I'm gonna take this fork and go step. Gentle, gentle, not too crazy. Now we're gonna bake this for about 15, 20 minutes. Yeah. And then we'll be ready to eat. Yeah. They're nice and cool out of the yeah. oven so we don't burn ourselves on the hot jelly. Mm. Are they good? They're so good and flaky and yummy. Are they very, very good? For these recipes and more, head to today.com slash food. I love it. These also. are delicious. I requested, you know, these obviously can be made with regular flour, yeah. but I requested that we use the gluten-free flour because I want to see if you guys even notice a difference. You don't notice Good. a difference at all. It's no flaky, it's light. Very, very good. Yeah. These are yummy. Well done, Cal. Yeah, it's like thanks. a fancy homemade Pop-Tart. It is, basically. Delicious. Yeah, thanks, we guys. We ate like four of them. <laughs> I know, I can eat 15 of them. <laughs> we'll be right back. You really good. Light.
Tomorrow on the third hour of today, our holiday party style file. Coming up on Hoda and Jenna, she sat down with Oscar winners Julia Roberts and Maharshala Ali. We'll see it all tomorrow. What? Well, I, we had a little extra time. I was going to say something, then I'm like, forget it. Let's just say it. Well, now we're out of time. Bye-bye. Well. Today, two of Hollywood's biggest stars, Oscar winners Julia Roberts and Mahershala Ali. Plus, how to be the best dressed party guest this holiday season with some style tips from Jasmine Snow. And Beyonce's big weekend, her new concert movie shattering the box office, and we're talking about it. From Studio 1A in Rockefeller Plaza, it's today with Hoda. And Jenna. It all starts right now. Hey, hey, hey. How are you? It's Monday. It is the fourth day of December. We're all together. How you doing? Hello, hello. It seems I'm like thinking. you mean to. Yeah. No. Seems like oh, I couldn't hear anything anyway. Seems like you were really busy this weekend. Okay, first of all. We got our tree. Yes. And it, anyone who, who's been to New York or lives in New York knows that they just set up tree stands on all the different corners. And they usually have a shopping cart. You can yes. put your tree in and take it home. So we got a tree and we got a big tree. I we can't don't, believe you, it. We usually get a little one now, for this. Did you suggest the medium size to small? I wanted the smaller. And what and happened? And they, I got outvoted two to one. <laughs> Two children are like, we want that one. It's so cool. And so then we just, and by the way, it was so fun. We had Christmas music playing. Everyone was playing a carefree Christmas. That was on. We played, and, and you know what else we did? We watched The Grinch, not one time, not two times, but three times. Wow. The old one, the cartoon. Yes. Packages, boxes, and bags. You know that one? There's another cartoon that is still Scarier. short. Is it scary? Yes. We watched oh, how loves that one. Oh. And last night before bed, he said, you know who doesn't like Christmas? And I said, who? And I thought he, it was going to be a joke. He's like, the Grinch. <gasps> and I'm like, you're right. The Grinch does not like the Christmas. The Grinch does not. But now, it does seem as though everybody is singing along to our hit song, A Carefree Christmas. You know what? And by everybody, I mean the kids in my household. And the kids in my household, too. And, which we'll show a little later in the program, Julia. I had a chance to sit down with Julia Roberts and Mahershala Ali uh, for an interview. They're, they're doing a movie called Leave the World Behind. It's a scary, you know the book. You picked yeah, the book. Yeah, I picked the book. Ruman Alam. You picked the book. The Obamas were executive producers yes. on the book. Yes. And they're acting in the book, the movie. <laughs> uh, and then I decided at the end that I was going to play a little ditty for that. Now, you know, because I think it's a scary film into a heartwarming song. How did that go over well, when look, you played it? I said, I go, do you like this? And they were like, what song? First, look at their they, faces. Look, wait, I'm trying. Completely I was, shocked. Wait, I was willing them. I, I said to Julia, do you feel it? She goes, I feel you're feeling it. <laughs> <laughs> That's what she said. Or something like that. Anyway, we're going we're gonna to play I mean, that interview. The best thing ever <laughs> is that yesterday, Mila was very mad at Henry and I, just grumpy towards the end of the night. But we forgave, she forgave me. <laughs> Okay. Which, this happens. Wait, wait till you have tweens, and then I know you're judging me a little now. I'm not judging But she you. forgave me, and we were <laughs> laying in bed reading, and then we were going to bed, and I knew it was completely over because she started whistling, Bells of Holly make me jolly. <laughs> and I was like, are you whistling? She goes, yes. Gosh, who, did you write that song? And I said, we should have. We no, did not. We didn't. We're giving full credit to, to Dan and Sean. To Dan and Sean and Cheryl. And Cheryl. But you know what? It's an ear earworm. She goes, it is just it so really, catchy. You can't. It should be a jingle. She's right. It should be a jingle. Yeah. And by the way, it has lightened the load. 
for Christmas, hasn't it? It's cool. made us a made little us. more carefree. All right, let's talk music, uh, but let's talk Beyonce's music. Okay, please. Her film Renaissance opened on Friday, and it was huge. It made $21 million at the box office. And it also, this is, it not only did it make a ton of money, but it was critically highly acclaimed. It received a perfect 100 score. This is hard to do on Rotten Tomatoes. I know. I mean, because because this is a film. This is. With, it's not just. It's not the concert. Yeah. It's not like let's. You know, I couldn't go to the concert, so I'll watch the movie. Yes. It's different than that. It has it has some some documentary footage. Now, T Swift and Blake Lively. They both went to the premiere in London. We knew she was going to show up. I thought that was cool. That yeah. They, they support each other. And Blake posted a photo of the superstars. She said, it took me in, until adulthood to see that the instinct for women to lift each other up to their highest potential is the norm, not the exception. It's our job to show younger generations the power in aligning rather than dividing. There's space for us all. And by the way, I agree totally. with that forever. She, you know what? And at the beginning, it was interesting. She said that when she was young, she saw women pitted against each other. Mm. That was what her impression of it. I don't, I feel like that may have been in Hollywood, but I sort of have always seen yeah. women lifting each other up. And I, I feel think, like that should be the norm, you I know? Mean, I think, I really do think it's how you receive it too, because you could be working with someone who's super, super, super like competitive or, or not looking yeah. out for you. And I think you just have to decide, like they're not, you, you can make a choice about how much time you spend, yeah. what you're gonna take from that person and just find people who do lift you up. Because I feel like in all the jobs I ever worked, there were people yeah. who were trying to pull you down, but those weren't, that wasn't my Your group. Your people, yeah, so who like, cared, oh, you just. Yeah, okay, sorry, yeah. but I'm over here with these guys yes. and we're on a track going somewhere. Yeah. We're not sitting here to- Celebrating We're not knife other. fighting over some local whatever, yeah. you know, job. Yes. or something like that. Yeah, yeah you got to do it that way. Um, okay, so Meg Ryan is Glamour's latest cover star. Mm -hmm. Her la her last rom-com, What Happens Later, follows two former love interests as they wait for their pending flights mm -hmm. in an airport. Remember, they kind of spend the night in the airport. Mm -hmm. Well, when it comes to her own dating life, Meg tells Glamour her worst date was back in college. Yeah, she said a boy took her for a romantic motorcycle ride and dinner, and when it was over, she, it was like the best date. She said, boy, I had the best date, Phil except for his name wasn't Phil. <laughs> his name was Bob. It wasn't even Bill. No, it was Bob. It didn't even rhyme? And she never heard from him again. Oh, gosh. I've never done that on a date. However. However. <laughs> and I'd like to apologize to my brother-in-law for this, but at Barbara's wedding, I wrote a really beautiful toast. And I stood up, and I and I was pregnant with Hal. I'd so like to just, <laughs> I'd like to put it out there. Okay. My brain wasn't firing on all cylinders, and I stood up, and um, his name is Craig, and I was like, now welcome to our family, Greg. <laughs> And I couldn't, there's a picture of Barbara and I where we are, like, I couldn't, I don't even know what it was. I'm not sure where it came from because I know him very well. Yes, it wasn't it, like he was like, right, right, they'd right. They'd already been married once. <laughs> what do you mean? Like, they got oh, married yeah. for one time just with our family so oh, my grandpa could be the there and this was right. the party. Mm -hmm. I'd given, I'd already given it one time. The same toast again. <laughs> but I, and I was, I mean, half the people there were like, did she just call him the wrong name? Anyway. Did he forgive you? He forgave me. Okay, good. I think All right. So. It's, oh, guess what? You know what today is. What's that sound? Uh, okay, is that it? That's it. Okay, <laughs> it is time for another special holiday, holiday drop. drop. We're drop, we drop. We keep dropping things like it's hot. Remember, we dropped our music last we week. We all this remember. Week, we're dropping something else. Okay, let's see what's in here. Can oh, we, I we see. see mugs. It's our famous mug. It's the Today with Wait. Hoda and Jenna mug. Inside the mug is <gasps> nail polish. This is uh, the nail polish we're dropping. It's by Essie, and it's called Eternal Optimist. Optimist. Don't you love that? Oh, I love it. Oh, my okay, God. Okay, so this is the great news. Starting today, when you buy our Hoda and Jenna mug, you will get a free bottle Come of polish. So we want. So you're wondering, like, what does this nail polish look like on somebody's Look at hand? Donna's oh, nails. Okay. Look at, look at, look at, look at, look at Donna's hand. hand. Look at Donna's hand. Donna's hand matches. Wait, hold on. The ah, uh, beautiful. Mug. So it I like and it. Oh, and you can very, drink your mug. You can drink your mug, so you can be. It has all of our mottos. You know, you can be carefree yeah. and roll with it, or you can be 
polished and elegant. Yes. I, like it. I think it's cool. I love it. Do you it's like great. It? Yeah, and it's kind of sort of so like an elevated neutral. So too. you have yeah. to buy you have to get it here. You can't go to the manicure place and say, I'll take you to a yeah. No, you have to buy it here. But it, it dropped here inside this very you get this one for this. Because that's important. Eternal optimist. <laughs> you too can be an eternal optimist All today. All right. So thank you, thank you, Donna. So to get your mug and polish, scan that QR code right there or go to the NBC yes. store. Yeah. Slash. Or if you're in town, <laughs> all you have to do is go to the NBC store. Just go pick it up. Yeah. I brought all right. Supplies center. are limited. Everybody wants it. It's like our song. I'm taking one. Yeah. Okay, here you go. It's gonna trend. All right. Coming up next, a home alone reunion for Macaulay Culkin. Yeah. Class and new celebrity duo is sparking romance rumors. Look who's here in studio. Justin's got the scoop on all of us. After this. at that incredible holiday crowd outside. We love y'all, thank mm -hmm. you for coming to see us. It's time to get you all caught up on the hot celebrity headlines you may have missed over the weekend. It's The Scoop, and here's our guy, E! News co-host, Justin Sylvester. Justin, welcome, welcome. Thank you, good <gasps> morning. We want a Hollywood, a Hollywood reunion. You know we love that. I love a reunion, especially when it's nostalgic. Yes. Catherine O'Hare and Macaulay Culkin. Oh. He finally got his star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. First of all, he should have had that a decade ago. Yeah. But she came out and she gave a speech to him. She talked about how hardworking oh, and amazing sweet. he was and how grateful she was to be his mom. And you know how Macaulay Culkin has been such a private person yes, all yes, these years? Yes. He even got up there and thanked his wife, Brenda, who he now has two kids with. Brenda's song, Here She Is Right Here, and just said how much of a support she had been. And it was one of the first times we had yeah. ever seen Macaulay Culkin be really vulnerable. Yeah. yeah, there were some tears, right? There was a lot of tears. Yeah, so sweet. And a lot of times I read that list about people who get in those, you know, stars on the Hollywood sure. Walk of Fame, and I'm like, where did they come from? But he, he really deserved yeah, it. Yeah, he, he definitely did. Okay, it. let's talk about a Hollywood duo that's sparking some romance mm. rumors. Girl, this was not on my bingo card for 2023, <laughs> but I gotta it? tell you, I kind of like it. Okay, so do you watch Shameless and the Bear? I watched The Shameless. Bear. Okay, Jeremy you Allen White. Shameless? Yes, who played Lip on Shameless. Yeah. Can Phenomenal. Can you try The Bear for me? Okay, I'll try it. No, you should try The Bear, okay. especially after this. It's so good. So apparently, he has been spotted out with Rosalia, who is a pop star. Now, the two of them have both ended their relationships this summer. And I got to tell you, I reached off a comment. I didn't hear anything. But here's the thing that piqued my interest. What? <laughs> There like are a few restaurants this. in Los Angeles yeah. that yeah. if celebrities go to, they want to be seen. Okay, okay, tell them, tell them. Sushi Park is one of them. The Craig's is another one. We're going to go there next week. But Sushi Park is one of those restaurants. Oh. We saw Kendall and Bad Bunny. Oh, yeah. We saw Kylie Like with people George want Woods. their romance so out. They want their so romance out. that's where out. they went? That's where they went. Oh, that was on purpose. And I okay. think it's on purpose. Done so and done. They want done. people to know. Let's talk about the Golden Bachelor. What's there's a lot of there's a lot swirling around this. I, there's a lot. Yeah, talk to us. First of all, did you watch the Golden Bachelor? No, no but everybody told us you to. should. Yeah, it's phenomenal. Gary picked Teresa, who he went on the first date with, which yeah. everyone was rooting for. And here's the jam. For all your fans out there, you do not have to wait very long. These two are going to get married on TV on January 4th. Gary said he had no time at his age to wait for a wedding. Right. And he has to do it, do now. it now. But here's the interesting What's part. What's the dust up? Yeah. So you know how, like, every year the next Bachelorette is picked from the top five? Yeah. We could be getting a Golden Bachelorette, where the uh -huh. lady gets to choose from 25 men. 
and find the love of her life. Oh, that's that makes cool. sense. That's going to be amazing. All right, um, somebody at this table, and it's not and us. it's not us, <laughs> had a big cameo in I, one of the Bravo shows. I wouldn't say a big one. Well, I, I was, I, I was hiding. See. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hiding? You're right there. What do you mean? <laughs> I can't feel like we're family at this point. Oh, there y'all are walking. Yes. Wait, who are you walking in with? I couldn't tell. I was Faye looking Resnick, at you. My girl. And this now, is whose your party. Was this? This is Kyle's dinner party. But by the way, you are friends with Kyle. Yeah. She's one of my best friends. She's one of your best She's friends. She's one of my best friends. And I got to tell you, listen, when you mix a white lady with Chardonnay, <laughs> it is a dangerous combo, okay? <laughs> and the producers at Bravo, they don't feed you until the fight starts. Because they don't want, like, for continuity, you can't have a full plate, then an empty plate, then a full plate. So I was munching and drinking when all this drama was now, going on. Now, what was the what drama? Was we don't even know because... Has it aired yet? It airs, well, it airs every Wednesday, but right, the first part one. of the dinner aired, yeah. and it was Denise Richards was showing up after being off the show for a year. Camille Grammer, who hosted the dinner oh, party from Camille. Health seven years ago, was also oh, in the Camille. house. Faye Resnick and Camille didn't hey. get along. Sudden and collar fighting, it's all over the place. I think uh, you should be a regular on one of those shows. Would you ever be a regular? I couldn't. Would you ever do a reality show of your own? I would. Oh. Yeah. Okay. We should all do we should all do one. Okay, all right. <laughs> Let's do it. Okay, you can catch Justin weeknights at eleven on our sister network E. Coming up, my conversation with Julia Roberts and Mahershala Ali. We'll talk about their new movie, their parenting styles. Maybe we'll sing a little song <laughs> right after this. And it was well, it all starts with you. Coming up tomorrow, we'll have some fun with music superstar and mom, Megan Trainer. Plus a very merry performance from the talented Matt Rogers. Oh, I can't wait. And Bobby has some great holiday gifts for all those beauty lovers on your list. That's all Tuesday on Hoda and Jenna. Welcome to today. Every day. We are adding to the star power in our studio. The biggest names, only on today. See, it worth coming in this early, right? Hey, buddy, it's today. Like I won the lottery. How do you feel at this age, this stage? Liberated. We're just getting started, folks. Ain't no stop with us now. The boys are back in town. The boys are back in town. The miracle. This has been fantastic. Everything and everyone you're talking about, only on today. Okay, Hoda, it's not every day that you get to sit down with two Oscar-winning actors. Yeah, this was a fun one. Julia Roberts and Mahershala Ali, uh, they've teamed up. They've got a new Netflix thriller. It's super scary, and you know <laughs> this, because it's called Leave the World Behind. It's from a book that you chose a while back. I caught up with them right here in New York City to talk about the film, their families, and more. Take a look. Who has more Oscars? I don't know the answer. <laughs> you have more? For sure. You have, I mean, do you have two? Yes. <laughs> you have two Oscars? Yes. Very cool. We got two Oscar winners in front of us. They are two accomplished actors who also happen to be parents. Mahershala Ali and wife Amatu Sami Kareem have a six year old daughter. I feel like I've always had a general sense, a good sense of the things that matter in life. But I think that it becomes more articulate when you have a child. And I think when you have a daughter specifically, you be, as a man, you see the harms of the world in neon, mm -hmm. <laughs> so to speak, because of how much girls from a very young age have to navigate to have the best chance of being in their whole full self by the time they're an adult. 
Julia Roberts and husband Danny Motor have three kids of their own. Your kids are in college and one's about to go off to college. Mm -hmm. So you're kind of parenting adults in a way. I parent them the same way out of the house that I parented them in the house. Which is? Which is, you know, are you getting enough sleep and you sound like you're sick and are you drinking tea? Yeah. And yeah. text me when you get home. We all were on a FaceTime the other day together, <laughs> all of us. And it was like this, like, gift that we had, yeah. these four minutes of yeah. all looking at each other, and that we were all so happy to be together in that way. And I love your family. I love how you speak <laughs> about them. Every time you talk about them, I feel like you're home. Well, it all starts with Danny Motor. You mm -hmm. know, he's just really <clears throat> our anchor and our person, yeah. and in the most beautiful way, our, the captain of our ship, <laughs> you know, truly. And it's not like giving it all away to him it's just that for me, understanding how deeply felt life could be really started with him. Wow. Get her a tissue. <laughs> I love love, man. When it's yeah. real, I can feel it. I, yes. I swear, a couple of things that you guys both said, yeah. I could feel chills up and down my body. Yeah. I'm like, that. Yeah. Mahershala has built an impressive list of credits in his career, but this is the we first time the two Hollywood heavyweights have worked together, starring in the apocalyptic thriller, Leave the World Behind. What yes. was the experience like, Julia, working with this man? This is the first time I've had to talk about him in front of him, so it's, it's sort of embarrassing. You know, there's just a poetry to the way that he carries himself in life and in art, in my experience. A poetry, that's a that's a beautiful way to describe you. Um, Very kind of you. How would you describe working with Julia? It's a joy, yeah. a joy. That makes all the difference in the world, enjoying who you're working with, because so much of our work has to do with, like, playing in vulnerable places. Mm -hmm. I'm so sorry to bother you that this is our house. The film is based on the 2020 novel and touches on the dark side of technology as well as racial tension in America. Well, I, look, I've been 6'2", I've been 6'2", since I was 14 years yeah. old. Dark-skinned black man, proud to be. But that comes with certain things in walking and navigating this world. And people's reaction to you is ahead of your consciousness and understanding yeah. about why they're reacting to you a certain way a turning over of, of the ring on the subway, or mm -hmm. someone crossing the street in a mm -hmm. certain way, or an extra set of questions. You walk the earth sort of defensively. And while the film can be intense, it does have its lighter moments, including a playful dance scene. But wait, the way you move? Yeah, but that song, I think we heard it enough. And speaking of music, you know I could not pass up this opportunity. This is a song um, that Jenna and I have released. Would you like to hear okay, it? Okay, yes. It's a Christmas single. Okay. It was charting. This is you? <laughs> Are you feeling it? I feel you. I feel you feeling yeah. it. Wow. How? Okay, first of all, when did you have time? We did it because we, first of all, we did it for fun and then it, it's gonna be a every Christmas. That okay. is so. This is an original song. You, you wrote it. Okay. We're getting no compliments here. No, no I'm no, really impressed. No, I'm, I'm, I'm totally I'm impressed. Like, Congratulations. <laughs> Watch out, Mariah Carey. Yeah. <laughs> and I want to just add a PS <laughs> on the end of that. When we walked out, Julia was singing it. She said it was an earworm. We cut that this part out. This was her face, which I loved. <laughs> I feel you feeling it. We need to make a pillow that says, I feel, I feel you, you feeling it. it. I love um, it. Oh my gosh. Wait. That, wait, can we listen? Yeah, let's listen. Is there something? I don't know. And now it's an earworm. Yeah. It's gonna, it's gonna be, be a carefree Christmas. Christmas. Oh, what? <gasps> yes! It's already. Yes! See? You go. We you, did get that. You got two Oscar winners singing our Grammy nominated song. You know what? <laughs> oh my gosh. <sighs> Namaste. Okay. okay, thank you for asking them the of hard course. hitting questions. We had to. You guys, leave the world behind. It's an incredible book. It is now also a film. It's in select theaters now, and it's on Netflix starting Friday. I think Ruman Alam is going to be here later this week. The oh, really writer. cool. Awesome, yeah. awesome. All right, coming up next, be the best dressed at the party. Yeah. Oh, we're going to show you some hot holiday looks after this. <laughs> Merry 
Merry Christmas from Oda and Jenna with... Y'all are invited to a few holiday parties this month, but you have nothing to wear. Look no further. Style expert Jasmine Snow is going to make sure you are the best dressed at the party with some looks that are on trend right now. Hi, Hi Jasmine. Jasmine. How okay. are you? By the way, we've peeked at all of your looks. They're amazing. But velvet, a beautiful velvet, velvet. dress is a nice way Let's to start. Let's talk about Megan. I mean, Megan looks so cute. Black velvet for this season is so luxe. There's no better way to go. Think of a jumpsuit as your new LBD. She I love does. a jumpsuit. I she love already a jumpsuit. Has. It's so flattering, especially <laughs> in the wide leg. Uh -huh. It makes your legs look so long and gorgeous. Love the feathers embellished here. Mm -hmm. A little something extra to make you feel extra special and festive. And then a pop of sparkle with the bag. Look how cute that is bag that a, is. I don't know I if we're know, talking prices, so but are they pricey? Amazon. What? Swear. Amazon. No, you did Swear. not. Yep. For Under real? 50. I swear. Oh, Drew, wow. It's really on Amazon. Great. <laughs> it's going to sell out. Oh, Thank you. All right, let's move Thanks, on Megan. down. Okay, Beautiful what better suit. way love this. to turn heads in a power suit? Mm -hmm. It's the most festive we color. We heard red is the color of the season. I mean, red is the color of the season, but it's the color going all the way through the year. So you can wear this even after the season. Yeah. Obviously, you love it for the holidays, but you can take it apart and you can wear just the jacket, just the pants. It's from Target. Under 50 wow. for each piece. Wait, what? Swear. I know. I'm I really love it. And that is that satin? Yeah. Yes, it's a silky satin. It's so beautiful because it has that high shine for the holidays. And then just a really nice bodysuit underneath. This is Skims. Keeps everything clean. Oh, that's so, a good idea. Yeah. And the shoes are cute, too. The shoes are so cute. Okay. And we just did something simple for the accessories. Yeah. And then you just let everything else shine with the power suit. You okay. look beautiful. Gorgeous. Thank you. <gasps> okay, I love this skirt. What's happening Tell us here about this look top. on Jen. Okay, so anything that's a little bit more casual, not a cocktail party. Party. This is perfect. We love a glitzy top. Mm -hmm. I love that it has this crop shape, which is very popular right now for button right. downs. We have extra sparkle here. You can dress it up with a beautiful metallic skirt. We love here. Mm -hmm. And then you can also do like jeans and flats and make it even more casual. Well, if two you want pieces to. kind of helps do that, right? Yeah, like of you course. can mix and match. Absolutely. Tell us about the boots. The boots, so cute. Throw in a simple black boot. Mm -hmm. These are Mark Fisher. We love them, but really just keeping everything really fun with the crop top Cute. and I just love that it's all sparkle. Okay, awesome. price point? Price point, really, Ish. really good. Affordable? This is J. Crew. Yes, very J. affordable. Crew? Shop Avera. Both of them so affordable, under 100. Amazing. Okay, let's move on Allie. to Allie. This feels like a good New Year's Eve mm -hmm. look. Okay, this is sequin season that we're in, you guys. Love this. I know everyone thinks of red and green this time of year. Mm -hmm. Pink. Pink. Barbie Pink core. is still happening. Barbie core, yeah, it's you're right. It's Barbie core coming through from the summer. Think Barbie core meets metallic trend. Mm -hmm. This is what you have. I love that you can throw on a black jacket like this. Yeah, that's cute. It keeps things really simple and sleek, cute. but then you let all the shine and the party happen with the dress. Love it. And then same thing, minimal heels, very cute. This is also Target. 
Oh, Talk. wait, what? The How dress did you find like, all these things? I, I mean, I'm not good. I know. Target. It's gorgeous. Oh Isn't it beautiful? I love it. I love, love the it. bag with the bow. It's just a little extra something to feel festive. Jasmine, Jasmine thank you. Thank you so, so thank much. Coming up hi. next, it's time to deck out your decor. Yeah, designer tips to help you create a luxe holiday look at home this. after this. These are also you guys amazing. look awesome. I'm Welcome to today. So happy to see you guys. Would you like my boost? Yes. Get back. Here we go. Boom. Sometimes we just do things to help. That's our Hoda. <laughs> happy birthday. We got an awesome crowd, y'all. All right, if you haven't gotten around to decorating for Christmas just yet, or you want to spread even more holiday cheer around the rest of your home, we got you covered. Yeah, Preston Conrad, the founder of Preston Conrad Home, is going to show you how to elevate your seasonal decor on a budget, this is what you do so well. You I'm, know we love a luxe look well, for less around here. And I love your, by the way, the palette you use on this tree is awesome. I like the red and the gold Thank together. Thank you. I mean, that's my number one tip. Yeah. When it comes to the trees, like, kind of narrow it down to a palette. And I love that we're seeing this big return to that, like, Home Alone era holiday Traditional. palette. Traditional. Yeah. The yeah. reds, the golds, the plaids. We added in some extra ribbon that we had in the crafting closet. Popped look in some that. pine Pretty. cones. Pine cones look Some good. great, uh, fun berries here. Well, but the if, best thing about the pine cones is you can use real ones. A hundred percent. Just pop them in the tree. But get this. This is one of my hacks that I love. Wow. So when I used to be a window designer for the big retail stores in New York mm -hmm. City, this was an old trick. We love to call these ornament clusters. So what do you and mean? they help make your tree look a lot more elevated. Fuller. So yes, yeah, so you're going to grab some pipe cleaners just from like your kid's craft closet mm -hmm. and then jam a bunch of these onto your pipe cleaner. You can Where? do whatever you like. All one color. You could add some berries in there. And then you're just going to twist it up like this. And then we're going to jam that in Where the tree. Put it? Let's see. And look at this. It just instantly makes it oh, feel yeah. more cool. Do you see how cool you see that, that looks? Shot? I love that it just add, it adds that little bit of volume Oh, and I texture, like that. And it makes it look a bit more luxe. It's like a hair extension for it's a Christmas a tree. <laughs> that is the best way to think of this. But my tip with trees is the more, the merrier. Fluff it out, add more stuff, and have fun clustering some ornaments, right? I like Cute. that. That's fun. That. And kids all can right. even do it. Okay, let's totally. talk mantles. Yes. Mm -hmm. What are you into? So, look, we all order that, you know, artificial wreath or yeah. the garland, garland online, and you're like, it looks so sad, my $20 yeah. garland, right? Yeah. So first of all, when in doubt, fluff it out. That's okay. my number one trip. You want to fluff out every single branch. So just pull these all pull out. Pull them all apart. You want to make sure that it, if it comes flat like this, it expands to about this wide, okay. right? But then it's time to add on those layers. So what I love is if you run to your local grocery store, yeah. to your craft store, grab those. some magnolia. Now, can you <gasps> magnolia use real magnolia? These, these, these are, are real. These are real. So when I was at Ralph Lauren, it was the more magnolia, the better, right? Okay. And we love to just jam that in wherever Look, we it's actually need. so easy it's because of the wire so you can kind of connect wrap it around. It's so easy. And then, Hodo, I'm going to okay. give you some What's fresh the, pine. And we're just going to, you can just grab these. At where your, do you buy it? At you the can buy it at the grocery store, store at mm -hmm. the flower shop. Or if you want to do artificial, you totally can. But I like having a little bit of cedar that kind of makes it drip off like that. Just, you want to mix the textures. And then, how do you get the ribbon to look like you made it look? Honestly, I cut pieces about six to 10 oh, inches long. Short. And then just weave them in. Weave them in. Just oh. weave them in. I, the shorter, the easier, right? Correct. When you yeah. get that long piece of, yeah. you're it not, gets it's unwieldy. really hard to Only do all you the way around. Only you could do that. And look at trust me, that's a challenge. And then same with the wreath. You want to get it, put them in all throughout 
don't be too precious here. Yeah. I like when they kind of look, stick out to the yeah. side. Yeah. You've got some pieces mm -hmm. hanging off here, but you want to mix in the real with the artificial. Yeah, I think okay. that's a great, great right. idea. Okay, totally. talk to us about this trend, kind of the matte Guys, Christmas this ornaments. this is going viral. So these, by the way, Wait. are sold out. So the velvet ornament trend at Anthropology at Crate and Barrel, you cannot get your hands on them, and they're really expensive. Okay. But we can make them with what you have in your house. Okay. I love this so much. So, so grab you just some get ornaments. the ones that you already have. Yep, you're going to extra ones from the tree. You're going to pick out a pink color. So I've given you guys some fun neutrals. Okay. We've got them here in our dish. So and then, wait, here wait. we go. Oh, this, this is the magic ingredient. Oops. This is oh. baking soda. What? Throw it in the paint. Throw what it in does the paint. that do? What it's going to do is it's going to not only texture? chunk up the paint and give it texture, but it gives it that really fun matte look. So we're going to mix oh, it all yeah, together. Yeah, yeah, use the I whole see. thing? Yeah, mm -hmm. just go Dump crazy it on it, right? Mix it all good. I think craftiness fun. This is so fun. It? And then you're just going to paint it. Now, listen, you're going to need like two or three coats, but magic of television, we may not have time to do that. But what's fun is you can just paint them up, pop them right in like a little cup or something to dry. What's fun is you can do this with the kids. Hoda, I saw you just decorated. Yes, we with decked the it. got a full tree. Yeah, full tree. Real tree, but this is a fun, God, you know, craft to get the satisfying. whole. Isn't it fun? Yeah. Maybe I should be painting more. Can you yeah. feel the grit in the baking yeah. soda? Yeah, is in that there? what gives it the texture you totally. like? That so, makes it look almost cement. -y. Yep, and then watch this, guys. After these dry and you get your multiple coats in, yeah. how pretty is this? Use your that. extra pine cones Gorgeous. and your extra pine and make a, and make a fun <gasps> centerpiece. You could do this on your entry console, you could do this on your dining table, and you don't have to go. Trendy neutral. You could do, you know, gold, whatever. Maroons, sure. golds, yeah. whatever paint you have, right. the more fun, the merrier. I love it. Yeah. Great. Oh my gosh, Preston, you always bring us the you best so ideas. Fun, we guys. love you. Happy holidays. Coming Thank up, you. big story. Our good friend Karen Swenson on the unique way she's helping other women find success oh, this right is after this. You don't want to miss it. I like that. Isn't this fun? By the way, it's very. Good morning, welcome to you today. With shaking eggs and bacon. Hold what? on, I'm just gonna say it. What? Badass. Oh, thank you. So do you think you'll act forever? <laughs> Boom. <laughs> We're gonna have lots of fun yeah. this morning. Yeah. My friend Karen Swenson learned firsthand that life is about change. And I've watched her as she and her daughter, Catherine, have navigated hard times with grace and optimism. Yeah, Karen has taken that experience and transformed it into a platform of hope and encouragement for all of us navigating this rapidly changing world. It's called, of course, Life's About Change. And the best part of this is she's taking other inspiring women along for the ride. We're going to talk to Karen in just a moment. But first, take a look at her story. Life's about change, right? I think each of us personifies change. We're all evolving, we've all got something, everybody's got something, but if we help each other navigate it, we can get through to the other side stronger and better for it. Karen Swenson learned the hard way that life is about change. In 2011, her husband John was diagnosed with cancer. A dear doctor friend called me and I said, what's your advice? She said, get a candle. Have John look at the flame. That's his inner spirit, his will to live, his love for you and Kathy. And then he's got to keep watching it and see the wax strip away and believe that those are the cancer cells. The body will go where the mind takes it. He was given one year and he, he made it seven. And that's seven extra birthdays, seven extra Christmases, seven billion dinners and conversations. When John passed away, Karen taught her daughter Catherine a beautiful lesson. Don't get lost in what is gone, but focus on what remains and the promise ahead. 
And so after more than 25 years as a news anchor, Karen left her job to start a new business, offering inspirational candles, pottery, and other items in hopes of helping others see that promise is ahead. It's been equal parts exhilarating and terrifying and humbling, all of it in one big ball. Life's about changes more than a marketplace. It's a source of hope, a mantra. I've been very intentional in who I've decided to work with. Karen partners with other small businesses, mostly women. We're almost without exception all moms. We've got different vendors who are bringing their life experience to their craft. Women like Solange Ledwith, who joined the Air Force at age 31. I just, you know, was at a point in my life where I didn't feel like I was doing enough. I, I, it had to be about something bigger than me. As a veteran, Solange started a glass blowing business where she makes candles for Life's About Change. Each candle uniquely crafted by hand over a 2000 degree flame. You put yourself and your emotions um, on something tangible. People respond to it the most. People respond to that human touch because I think they can relate to it. And then there's Jenna and Amanda from Prodigal Pottery, where all of the art is handmade by women fleeing homelessness and domestic violence. They make the mugs for Life's About Change. There's just something special about taking a seemingly ugly lump of clay and molding it into to something beautiful, which is the same with, you know, mine and Jenna's lives and all the lives of the women who work here. Each time they make something, a little piece of them is part of it. For them, art is part of the healing process. I hope that the, the products are received the way they are created, right? With intention and positive energy and a communal sense of support. Letting people know that they're not alone. That's it, you're not alone. Not now, not tomorrow, not ever. So Karen, there's so many cool parts about this platform, but you built it and it ended up helping like lots of other women. I've been surprised yeah. by it, right? Yeah. Both the reaction from maybe the people who've purchased products or they're sharing their stories. Mm -hmm. And then of course, the artisans that we partner with yeah. by help, you know, by partnering with us, mm -hmm. they're also getting more exposure. And that's what I want to do is to elevate them. Well, and these products are gorgeous and they employ, they're about goodness mm -hmm. too. It's not just, a candle, it's yeah. a candle that means something. So tell us a little bit about yeah. that. Everything is really intentional. So the bracelets, they each have um, a saying, right? So that when we put them on in the morning, we're, we're dressing with intention. Oh my gosh, it's like a mantra, acceptance. Mm -hmm. yes. What do they say? Acceptance, acceptance. peace. peace. Wait, I want to. I just want to say, although there's a beautiful message behind yes, these candles. they're amazing. They actually smell like, smell that. Oh, oh my, Hoda I want gave, it. Hoda gave us these and look how beautiful this is. This That's is a special, beautiful. special gift. Yeah. And right and now, I, we got yeah. Today 30. If you use Today 30, you're gonna get 30% off all of these products. Wait, oh you so wait, Today 30, wait, I wanna smell the Today 30. Oh my God, and these are so incredible. I want these. And I this, want. these are Christmas The ornaments, ornaments are, yes, those are on clear acrylic mm -hmm. and they have the watercolor wreath. Beautiful. Mm. Again, Beautiful. love, hope, joy. I okay, guess, if you want them, yes. where do you get them? <laughs> where do you get all this? Life'saboutchange.com. Life'saboutchange.com. You know what, it's Only so, e right I mean, now. Hoda is so proud of you. She yeah. talks about you all the time, but the fact that you've created something that that not only brings joy to other people but helps employ yes. women and it's yes. just remarkable you're all about yeah. hope well and so are you and i thank you too because also changing chapters that whole segment is yes. about that inspiring yeah. others by showcasing somebody who's been there and mm -hmm. done it. Okay, well, these are We're beautiful, wear beautiful. Some bracelets. Yes. Oh, holiday okay. gifts. I'm Happy doing holidays. peace and acceptance. All right, Karen, thank you so <laughs> thank much. Thank you so much. I, I like we'll be that. back right Today after 30. this. Today, Today 30. 30. Don't forget your code. <laughs>
Good morning, everybody. Here's what's happening in your neck of the woods. Oh, you deserve to be celebrated. Way to go, Reynolds. Oh, Al. Al, you're all of our heroes. Yeah. Y'all love Al Roker. <laughs> Coming up tomorrow, our good friend Megan Trainer's going to come Plus, by. It's a fun holiday song from the talented Matt Rogers. Oh, that's who's got a good one. And Bobby's got gifts for the beauty lovers on your list. We'll see y'all Tuesday, y'all. Bye. Bye. Fa la la la. -la. It's the Great American Holiday Cookie Swap on Today All Day. This year, we're celebrating the season in a big way, bringing you 52 delicious and delectable cookie recipes from all across the country to ring in the holiday cheer. Coming up, beloved bloggers, seasoned chefs, and food-savvy friends will all be sharing tasty hometown treats. Fancy a beautiful Buckeye Diamond from Ohio? How about cookie cow fudge from Wisconsin? Well, just keep watching. Over the next four hours, we are going coast to coast, starting in the Northeast, then we'll head over to the South, then over to the Midwest, the Southwest, and finally the West Coast. We have an amazing lineup for you today. Celebrity chefs like Duff Goldman and Christina Tosi will be joining us. And you don't want to miss special recipes from Layla Ali and Martina McBride, plus a few members of the Today family, including yours truly, will be sharing our favorite cookies to make this time of year. Throughout the show, look for this QR code that will appear at the bottom of your screen for recipes and more information on how you can give back this season. Feeding America, the country's largest network of food banks, is working to fight food insecurity. During this special, scan your smartphone here to find out how you can volunteer or donate to help local food banks fill plates and hearts this holiday season. So let's get baking. First up, we are kicking things off in the Today Show's home state. Take it away, Adam Richman, repping New York. Hey, what's up? It's Adam Richman here, and I was born and raised in Brooklyn, New York. So I can't wait to show you guys a real taste of my childhood. Now, hamantaschen are traditionally made for the Jewish masquerade holiday of Purim, but they are absolutely delicious any time of year. Now, to celebrate the Big Apple, I've created an apple pie filling for this classic cookie, and I just know that you and your family and friends are going to love it. I like to work with a combination of Granny Smith and Golden Delicious. So we have some brown sugar. I'm gonna put that on in here. Some granulated white sugar. And we have the confectioner sugar. So like every good apple pie filling, we're going to add a little bit of lemon juice, a little bit of vanilla, and apple pie spice. And of course, we're gonna add some cornstarch. We wanna make sure that there's no lumps of dry ingredients or there's some, well, pardon me, but kind of naked apples. So now we're gonna cook this all down and make a nice, ooey, gooey, sweet and sticky apple pie filling for the center of our hamantash. But we don't wanna put this directly into the pan because it'll burn, especially with all that sugar. So that little bit of fat is gonna help coat the pan and also, you know, everything's better with butter. Make sure it coats the whole bottom of the pan. And essentially, we want it to be close to almost like a caramel apple you get at the fair. And you see how it moves all together? As we say in Brooklyn, bing bang. This is what we're looking for. Take it off the heat. Oh, man. It smells like a Norman Rockwell painting makes you feel. First off, we have some cubes of chilled butter. It's going to create a beautiful color, beautiful smell, and a real great richness and flakiness to the dough itself. So we have two and a half cups of flour. To that, we're going to add some confectioner's sugar. We're gonna add baking powder, not baking soda. And then, of course, we're gonna keep that theme going with those wonderful warm spices. Anyway, we're gonna throw in two pinches of salt right into the dough. And then we wanna add about a teaspoon of orange zest. Um, my grandma, my great aunt used to add orange juice. Remember, you don't wanna go down to what's called the pith, which is the white layer. We want that top orange layer 
which has all of the real essential oils that go into an orange. Let's go over to the food processor. So we have our butter, we have some brown sugar. We're gonna pulse this together till it has the consistency of almost sand, like clumpy sand. To that, we're going to add a little bit of vanilla extract and two eggs. We're gonna pulse it again. So now we've combined the wet, we're gonna slowly add in a little bit of that dry. Now, if you have a big work surface at home, you can actually uh, put flour on it and you wanna work as quickly as you can while it's cold. And you wanna roll this dough out till it's about an eighth of an inch thick. So outside in, you wanna work in all the different directions. So beautiful rolled out dough right here. So you can use a ring cutter. I actually use a pint glass. Take it, give it a little bit of a twist. And there you go, we have it. Put it right here onto our sheet pan. There we go. So we're gonna take a dollop of this filling. Don't overfill, I can't stress this enough. You want it to be like a little bit of a burst of flavor. So you wanna put it in the center, but you wanna make sure that there's ample room all around. Take a brush, dip it in the egg wash, and we wanna brush all the way around the round of the cookie. That's gonna help it stick even during the cooking process. So what I like to do is I take two ends and I make essentially a cone. See, cone, it has the juice. So I take this, now we have this sort of fan shape. I bring these up, give it a pinch, and there's the hamantash. Now we wanna go back in with the egg wash and really get on those folds first and foremost. And there's your hamantash. I'll repeat that just in case you missed it the first time. All right, these are stuffed, these are folded. Throw them into a 375 degree oven for 10 to 12 minutes till they're golden brown. Here they are, fresh, golden, and delicious. Apple pie hamantash and representing New York. I dressed for the occasion, representing my junicorn roots. And whether or not you're even in the great state of New York, wherever you are, whoever you are, however you celebrate your holidays, whatever you eat, may your holidays be sweet. I'm Tiffany Faison, and I'm making gorgeous fluffernutter cookies from the great state of Massachusetts. Fluffer Nutter sandwiches are a New England icon. They're peanut butter and sweet marshmallow fluff in a sandwich together. We love them so much, we have a festival to celebrate fluff every year. We're starting with our dry ingredients. Here we have our flour, baking soda, and baking powder. And then we just wanna give those a quick whisk just to combine. Now that we have our dries mixed, we are gonna head to Buttertown. So it starts with about two cups of butter. This is room temperature butter. Pretty important that it is room temperature. We're gonna add the other butter, the peanut butter. So can't have a fluffernutter sandwich without peanut butter. Throw this in here. It's gonna get a little gooey and a little messy. Guys, it's cookie time, it's the holidays. Nothing to get concerned about. You want this gorgeous, airy, fluffy mix. That's what we're looking for. So to this mixture, to our peanut butter and butter mixture, we're gonna add light brown sugar. And granulated sugar. Same thing, scrape down, let it fly. This is our vanilla extract. Just gonna throw that into our eggs before we add it to, just for ease of convenience. Okay, so to our mixture of peanut butter, butter, sugar, eggs, and vanilla, we're now gonna slowly add our dries. Let's get our oats in there. You don't have to be precious with them. They'll stand up to a good mixing. So now the fun part. We are going to scoop our cookie dough onto our sheet tray. We want them big because we're gonna pipe some fluff into our peanut butter cookie. It's gonna be gorgeous. So this is, for me, this is like a perfect holiday cookie. 
And I'd be remiss to tell you that I wait to the holidays to make this cookie. We start in Massachusetts, the minute the leaves hit the ground, there's pumpkin and apple everything around here. So I start making pumpkin breads and I start making apple butter. It's just, reminds me of why I choose to live here. So we have our cookie scooped. What we're gonna do is just take our scooper and make a little indention. Just use the back side of it. It's gonna stick a little bit, don't worry about it. Cookies are never meant to be perfect. Just like people. So to this, we have our fluff. Fluff is super versatile. We use this for everything. We fix cars, we you know spackle houses, we eat it, just kidding. So just a little scoop of fluff in the middle, about a quarter of the total fluffernutter cookie. Just gonna pipe that in. And you could bake it just like this. You're just gonna have a fluff center. I'm gonna go ahead and just Scoop the cookie around the fluff to where when it bakes, it sort of all melts together and it's combined when you eat it. So these guys are going in the oven eight to 10 minutes, 325 degrees. You can rotate the pan halfway through, make sure that they're cooked GBD, golden brown delicious, really consistently all the way through. It smells incredible in here. It smells like peanut buttery, nutty, buttery goodness. These are gorgeous. The biggest problem with these is their disappearing act that they pull. And they're crispy on the outside, chewy and fluffy on the inside. Look at that, so good. It's like the fluff equivalent of a cheese pull in a cookie. Ugh, you guys have to make these cookies. They really are straight from the heart of Massachusetts. One of my favorite holiday treats. Oh my God, so oh good. Hi everyone, I'm Zoe Francois, the host of Zoe Baked, and I'm representing the beautiful state of Vermont. Today, I'm sharing a recipe inspired by the flavors of this beautiful state, my Vermont maple raisin holiday cookies. They're chewy and sweet from the raisins with a maple glaze, and they're absolutely perfect for holiday baking, so let's get started. To start my cookies, I'm gonna make a really simple dough. It's a very soft, sticky dough, so once you make it, you wanna wrap it up into a packet and refrigerate it for at least an hour. Once it's chilled, I'm gonna roll it on a silicone mat. I am gonna dust the sill pat with just a tiny bit of flour to prevent it from sticking. I'm gonna take my dough, put it right on top, and then I'm gonna put the plastic right back on top of the dough so that the dough won't stick to my rolling pin. I'm gonna roll this out to a nine by 11 rectangle. Once your dough is all rolled out and ready to go, I'm just gonna peel the plastic away and then I'm gonna cover it with my chopped up raisins, but you can also use craisins or any dried fruit you want. I'm gonna put that onto half of the dough. And then I'm gonna fold the other half over the raisins. I'm gonna do the exact same thing. It's okay if those raisins poke through. In fact, you really want them to. It's part of the look, and also then you know that it's thin enough. I have a sheet pan that's covered in parchment paper. I'm gonna use my little Christmas tree cookie cutter and I'm going to cut out my cookies. So the next thing that I need to do is put a really light egg wash on these and then I'm gonna bake them at 350 for about 12 to 15 minutes until they're really golden brown and crispy and beautiful. My cookies are totally cooled and now I'm gonna add the best part, the maple glaze. You want it to be thick enough that it's gonna cling to the cookie but thin enough that I can just drizzle it. add just a little bit of festivity to it, so some little decorative sugar pearls. It just makes them a little more holiday. And that's it. So good. 
Merry Christmas from my family to yours. Man, those cookies are so festive. I think I'm feeling that holiday spirit. All right, coming up, we've got a gorgeous edible centerpiece and a family recipe from my very own kitchen. Stay tuned for more. Welcome back to today's Great American Holiday Cookie Swap. Up next, I've been enjoying these Christmas cookies since I was a little girl. It just isn't the holidays in my house without them. Christmas just isn't Christmas in my house without my great Aunt Tilly's cookies. They just remind me of big family dinners during the holiday season. And I love dipping these soft anise cookies into coffee. I even did it when I was little. We're going to start by mixing our dry ingredients. We're gonna add baking powder to the flour. And if you need to know anything about my family, we like salt. So a nice, nice hearty pinch of salt and mix that together. So now we're going to get to the wet ingredients. We're going to start with some vegetable shortening that you wanna melt and then cool. We're going to put our eggs right into the cooled vegetable shortening. We're going to add our sugar. Now my Aunt Tilly's secret was an entire bottle of anise flavoring. So when I'm mixing this together, I actually like to let it go for a little while to make it nice and fluffy. So now we're gonna add some of the dry ingredients. Start off slow, otherwise you will have flour everywhere. I'm just gonna scrape this down and then we can mix it by hand. This is where Calvin asked, can I lick the beaters? I know you're not really supposed to be doing it, but it was always the thing your mom let you do. And now looking back, it's like, well, it keeps them quiet for a few minutes. So like, here you go, have fun with that. So at this point, you can kind of make whatever size cookies you want, small, large. My Aunt Tilly actually used to get so sick of making cookies. She would make them into a nice log and then after they baked, she would slice them. So we always had sliced cookies instead of, you know, like little round cookies. So when you put these on the tray, you don't have to worry about them spreading like some cookies do. These more or less rise. So our cookies have come out of the oven. We let them cool because you don't want to put the icing on top of the hot cookies. But I want to just show you the color. On the top, you want them to still look sort of doughy. So now we're going to make the icing, which is probably the most stressful thing I do all year because you have to get the texture of the icing just right. So we have confectioner's sugar in here. Again, start off slow, like just put a little bit of water. Once it starts to loosen up though, it, it goes pretty quickly. All right, so once we have this here, we're gonna take our cookie, just turn it upside down, 
and give it a nice little squoosh on the top. I usually do two before I put some sprinkles on because once it starts to harden up, it's a little, the sprinkles don't stick as much. When it comes to sprinkles, only, only use these sprinkles. This is all my Aunt Tilly would use. This is all you're allowed to use. They're hard to find. They're non-pareils in multicolors. And then you just sprinkle them on top. And here they are, my great Aunt Tilly's Christmas cookies. Aren't they pretty? Happy holidays from my family to yours. Hey everyone, my name is Elijah Milligan. I lived in Philadelphia my entire life and I'm a diehard fan of everything Philadelphia sports. Today's cookies inspired by our Philadelphia Phillies who had a phenomenal season and really made our city proud. So today's cookie is going to be our Phillies Red October Red Velvet Cookies. This cookie combines our iconic Phillies colors and will make any holiday table look great and the flavor is out of this world. So first thing first, we're going to mix all of our dry ingredients. So we have our AP flour, we have our cocoa powder, baking soda, and sea salt. We're just going to give this a little whisk. Next step, we're going to cream our butter and sugar. We're just going to add room temp butter and sugar to the stand mixer and beat it for about five minutes so light and fluffy. We're just gonna go a medium speed. I think four should do the trick. Now we're gonna add one egg and we're gonna scrape down the sides of the bowl as well. And then we're gonna turn this back on at low speed. We're gonna add our vanilla extract, our buttermilk, and then our red food coloring as well. So we're gonna mix this until combined. Look at this bright, beautiful color. Reminds me of Christmas. Reminds me of the Phillies making it all the way to the uh, World Series. So next we're gonna mix the dried ingredients. I wanna let this go till it's fully incorporated. Oh, these look awesome. All right, this looks ready to go. So we're gonna turn this off, scrape any extra off of our paddle. Then we're gonna fold in our chocolate chips. Oh, this looks really fun. Make sure those are nicely incorporated. Oh, a little bit extra. This red, man. This is Christmas. This is Phillies. All in one bite. So I have a tray ready to go with some parchment. We're just going to scoop these with a one ounce scoop, leaving a little bit of space in between. So they are going to spread. Next up, we're going to lightly press down on each mound. And that's just going to flatten it slightly. They don't have to be perfect. You want a little rustic shape to these. So next up, we're gonna bake these off at 350. And that should make about 12 minutes. All right, so these have cooled completely. I've already started putting some powdered sugar on these. It just smells so good in here. These look nice and festive. Mmm, delicious, warm. Tastes like Christmas. Merry Christmas and happy holidays from my Philly table to yours. Hey everyone, I'm Skylar Bouchard and I'm representing the state of Delaware. I grew up in Delaware and although we're known as the small wonder, our state is full of so many big personalities. So I decided to make big, bold and flavorful cookies, the sweet corn cookie with a blueberry pie swirl. Our first step is to make the filling. It all starts with frozen blueberries, which I'm adding to a saucepan. And then we're gonna add a third of a cup of sugar. And we're just going to Coat the blueberries until they're fully coated. They look like sugar covered blueberries. We're gonna work on our thickener, which is so easy. It's just a third cup of water, a teaspoon of lemon juice. We're gonna add two tablespoons of cornstarch right to the water. We're essentially making a slurry. And we wanna mix this until all the clumps have dissolved so it's nice and smooth. I can hear our blueberries heating up. The perfect time. We're gonna add all of this right to the blueberries and mix this up. Now we're just gonna add a quarter teaspoon of salt and this really enhances that blueberry flavor and makes it taste more like blueberries. Trust me on that. <laughs> so we're gonna cook this over medium high heat and bring it to a boil, then reduce to a simmer, cook for 10 minutes, just stirring every minute or so until it's nice and thick. Now we're gonna work on our dry ingredients. This is so easy, you just whisk them all together in a bowl. So we're starting with two and two thirds cup of all-purpose flour. 
Then the main character, Masa Harina. This is used in yellow corn tortillas and it gives a really distinct corn aroma. Our next ingredient, corn starch. It's a teaspoon of kosher salt, one and a quarter teaspoons of baking soda, and half a teaspoon of baking powder. That's the dry ingredients. So, so easy. <laughs> now we're gonna make our dough. It starts by using chilled butter and creaming it with light brown sugar and white sugar. So I just finished creaming my butter and sugar. Now we're gonna add our eggs in. I have two chilled eggs and I'm gonna run this on low speed. So my eggs are all combined. I'm gonna put this on low speed and gradually add in my dry ingredients. All right, I'm gonna use a spatula to help me guide it in. Just a little bit at a time so it doesn't go flying everywhere. It's now time to make our cookies. So what I did is I separated my dough into 10 equal sized balls and we're just going to flatten one of these in the palm of our hands. So these are about half an inch thick like this and we're gonna basically make an empanada. We're gonna scoop our delicious filling and pop it in the middle, you see this? So we're gonna bring the edges around to encase this filling. And it's okay if the filling comes out because that's just gonna give you a beautiful swirl later. Delicious mistakes, let me tell you. And we're gonna roll this into a ball. Just carefully close any holes. So I'm dipping this into some crushed corn flakes for a nice delicious crunch and some more corn flavor. And I'm putting it on a baking sheet that I lined with nonstick spray. So I'm gonna do this four more times, put five on this baking sheet and five on another baking sheet because they do spread out in the oven. We wanna give them enough room to do their thing. So I let these cool for 10 minutes and now they are ready to serve. They are gooey and soft and delicious. My husband, I can see him in the corner of my eye. He's been so excited for these cookies. <laughs> I know, oh, I know you want yes. these. <laughs> you gotta crack one open with me. Can I grab, grab one? this one? It looks okay. like a juicy beauty. Oh, yeah. All right, ready? Oh, oh. look at that filling! <laughs> All cheers. <right>, cheers. Mmm. <laughs> oh wow. Mmm. That's the stuff. You did it. Mmm. These cookies are so good. Clearly my dog wants them. My husband loves them. So happy holidays from my family to yours. I hope you enjoy this recipe. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back with more holiday sweet treats from Aaron French, Nick DiGiovanni, and more chefs from the Northeast.
Welcome back to today's Great American Holiday Cookie Swap. Up next, edible Christmas trees that are truly almost too pretty to eat and an iconic treat from Maine. Hi everyone, I'm John Cannell, founder of Preppy Kitchen, and there is nothing better than Christmas in Connecticut. From the picturesque decorations around town to snowy walks, it's a wonderful place to celebrate the holidays. One of my favorite traditions is decorating our tree as a family, so today I'm making nutmeg Christmas cookie trees. I love a show-stopping centerpiece, and this edible one is actually surprisingly easy to make. Start with a big batch of cookie dough. Mine has two secret ingredients. A little bit of cornstarch will give you a nice sharp edge so your cookies don't spread. And a dash of nutmeg is a wonderful flavor for the holidays. Connecticut's the nutmeg state. We love spices during the holidays. And as an added bonus, I always freshly grate mine for added flavor. I'm rolling my dough out to about a quarter of an inch. Our cookies should have a nice structure so they don't fall apart when we stack them. Once your dough's rolled out, it's time to cut your star shapes. We're gonna stack these up at the end. We're gonna transfer these onto a parchment-lined baking sheet. They just need a little bit of space in between each cookie. They don't spread that much. The bottom layers are really big, so you will be re-rolling all the scraps. If you wanna have extra height and drama, you're gonna wanna cut extra cookies to place in between each level. They're gonna be hidden, so they're gonna be smaller shapes, but they're gonna send it lift your cookie tree up and make it look that much more realistic. My stars are all cut out. It's time to bake them 375 for about 12 minutes or until they're just taking on a golden color at the edge. Our cookies are baked and cooled golden brown underneath, so it's time to grab a cake plate and assemble them. I mixed up a big batch of buttercream. This has vanilla and nutmeg in it as well. It's a lovely combination of flavors. And for the green, I just used some green food coloring. We don't want this to move around a lot, so add a dollop of buttercream underneath. That's our glue. We're gonna add more buttercream. It's gonna add as our glue and hold everything together. You can use an offset spatula or any other tool you enjoy just to smooth things out so you have a nice flat layer of buttercream. Now we're gonna use a number 30 star tip. You could use any smaller star tip that you have hanging around. It's just gonna give you some texture and make it look like our tree is a little bit more realistic. Little dollops all over the surface of everything you see. Don't worry about the spacer, just the parts that are sticking out. And if it doesn't look perfect, it's totally okay. We're gonna cover this in Christmas ornaments, a little bit of snow, and you're not gonna be able to see any details. Time for the next layer. Just add some buttercream on top of your spacer, pop the next layer on, and repeat. Our tree is complete, but it's a little bit bare, so it's time to decorate it up to the hilt. We want all the ornaments on here, snow, and of course, a big golden star for the top. I like to start off with a light dusting of snow. We can always add more later, but it's so satisfying and it really makes it come to life. For the decorations, you have so many choices. I happen to have some jumbo sprinkles. They also sell like little chocolate candy covered spheres that you could use. You could make them out of marzipan or anything else. This Christmas tree looks nice, but it's definitely missing a star. So set this aside for just a moment and we're gonna grab some gold luster dust and another cookie. One star for the top. I'm gonna brush it with a little bit of glaze. You want a very thin coating just to make it sticky so it grabs the gold luster dust. Place your star on top and you're ready to celebrate the holidays. I made an extra one to try out. Merry Christmas and happy holidays. Mm. Hi Today All Day, I'm Erin French and I'm representing the great state of Maine. I'm bringing you a twist on a classic treat with my parsnip needums. They're usually made with mashed potatoes and are a great way to use leftovers in a unique way. I've spent my entire life in Maine and I'm excited to show off a tried and true sweet from our great state. I'm going to start with a, a bit of mashed parsnips. A parsnip is a cross between a potato and a carrot and I'm just going to add in a little bit of butter and then some confectionery sugar. And I'm just gonna stir it until the butter and the sugar start to melt. I know my Mainers might be a little bit upset with me calling this a cookie, but I wanna vote for it to be a steak cookie because I don't think we have one. And the next thing is we're gonna add in this flaked coconut. 
And then also um, a little bit of vanilla because that always makes the flavor a bit better. And you're just gonna work it to kind of make it almost like a dough. So you're gonna get the sweetness of the sugar, the creaminess of the butter, a little bit of vanilla, and then the crunch of that really delicious coconut. Now we've got this perfect, nice and sticky mixture here. This is how we're gonna form them. And I just make little pucks. It almost looks like a peppermint patty. That's kind of what I'm going for. These are pretty rich. There's a lot of sugar and you've got all the coconut. So it's not something you want a lot of. So a nice small size is really perfect. You just want a few bites, like three bites is the perfect bite for this. Classic main needums are actually made on a sheet pan and then you would slice them into squares. So you can do that too. This is totally gluten free which is kind of a nice thing to have if you're doing a swap because then you don't have to worry about dietary restrictions. I'm just gonna put it in the fridge and let this set up for an hour. We have a little bit of melted chocolate with some coconut oil. We go ahead and dunk them in. Move them around a little bit so they get nice and coated. And I'm just gonna carry on and finish the rest of them. And after they set for a second, you can sprinkle them with some salt. I'm making sure that I get both sides because I want chocolate on both sides so you get that perfect bite every time you bite into one. I'm gonna sprinkle them with a little bit of Malden salt. And I love Malden salt for finishing because it's flaky and it's a little crunchy. Once your chocolate's set, you're just ready to plate and share. These remind me of the holidays because they always felt like a special treat when I was a girl. If I got to get one off the counter at the convenience store, it felt special. So if I'm thinking about holidays and I'm thinking about something that tastes like Maine, this is, this is it for me. Merry Christmas and enjoy. Stay tuned, we'll be back with more cookies. Welcome back to the Great American Holiday Cookies Swap, folks. This next treat will definitely be a crowd pleaser at any gathering this time of year. Four score and seven years ago, I, Paola Velez, am one of Washington, D.C.'s most iconic pastry chefs, I think.
Today, I'm making Rock Creek Park cookies, an homage to one of Washington, D.C.'s largest nature spaces. So, let's get baking. The first thing that I'm going to do is brown my butter. But it's not brown butter per se, it's like toasty butter. Once you start smelling it, and once you start seeing, your butter is done. So this toasted butter is what makes my cookies fluffy because it still has a little bit of that moisture. So our butter is now cooled, and you can see because when you scrape it, it's nice and firm. We're going to add our granulated sugar. So we're gonna make sure that we get all of the delicious butter in here. So we're gonna set it on like speed one first. Now we're gonna do our eggs. And as that's mixing, we're gonna make sure that we add our vanilla. So here we have some all-purpose flour, kosher salt, and some baking soda. I'm gonna put in like half, and we're gonna do almost like a mixer shuffle. So, let's incorporate the rest of it. So we're gonna stop here. We have our mini marshmallows, and these guys represent like the white oak trees that line Rock Creek Park candy-coated chocolate rocks. It's gonna be rocks that belong in Rock Creek Park. A little bit of 70% dark chocolate. Washington, D.C. is kind of serious, and this chocolate is serious. We're gonna add walnut pieces as well, and this is gonna lend a little bit of earthiness. We can't forget the sour cherries. Cherries are Washington, D.C.'s national fruit, but also George Washington, am I right? And Q earrings. We're ready to get scooping. So we're gonna do two of these scoops per cookie. So I'm just gonna add one right here, and then add one right on top. And then we're gonna shape them. So for this cookie, I wanna do two scoops because I really want to get that volume, but I want a little bit more spread. So we're gonna shape these guys. We're gonna make sure that we press in and just a little slight squish, and there you have it. So we've baked our beautiful cookies, and then for that last and final minute, I take a cookie cutter that's round and I shape them while they're hot, bake them for more last minute, so that we can get one beautiful round Rock Creek Park cookie. And there you have it, gentle peoples, Rock Creek Park cookies. Merry Christmas, Feliz Navidad, and enjoy. Mmm. Hi everybody, my name is John Bawadi. I'm the chef and owner of Bearded Baking Company, and I am representing New Hampshire, the beautiful state that I was born and raised. To me, there's nothing better than a crisp fall night, roasting marshmallows, making s'mores by the bonfire. So today, I'm making campfire cookies inspired by those good times. These cookies are ooey, gooey, and delicious. They embody everything that I love about New Hampshire. So let's get started. We're gonna prep up all of our ingredients. So, to begin, we will add all of our dries into one mixing bowl. Next, we will cream our sugar and butter together. Scrape the edges, and then we will add our egg. And then we'll add our one teaspoon of vanilla. I have a half teaspoon here, so we'll add two of those. Right, and we'll mix that until it's just incorporated, and then we will add our dry ingredients. And then as your dough starts to combine and come together, you're gonna to wanna to add your chocolate chips, marshmallows, and graham crackers as well. And then we just wanna lightly mix these into the batter here. Once our dough is combined, we can start to scoop the cookies. I will be making some golf ball shaped size cookies with my hands. But if you'd like to use a cookie scoop, you can definitely do that as well. And you wanna be putting these on a parchment lined sheet pan.
once we have our cookies rolled out, we can start to add some additional um, chunks of graham crackers and chocolate chips and marshmallows as well. Once your cookies are prepared, we're ready to go into the oven at 350 for about 10 minutes. After about 10 to 13 minutes, you're looking for the chocolate to melt, those marshmallows to be golden brown and nice and ooey and gooey, and your cookies are done. Merry Christmas and Happy Holidays. Hey, I'm Nick Giovanni, and today I'm representing my home state of Rhode Island. I learned my love for biscotti through my great-grandmother, Noni, who immigrated from Italy. And today I've created my own spin, a brown butter almond biscotti, which I'm going to show you how to make right now. So first we're going to start out by making our dough, and for that I'm going to begin with a large bowl, and then into that bowl go in with some brown butter, one of my favorite ingredients in all of food and cooking. You really have to make sure you scrape out all those really tasty milk solid bits because that's what gives you the real flavor of brown butter. Now into this bowl, I'm gonna go in with some vegetable oil. The traditional way of making biscotti actually only uses eggs, but it's changed a lot over the years. And even my great grandmother would say that there is no set way to make biscotti. Into this bowl, I'm gonna add a little bit of brown sugar and then add in our white sugar as well. And we're gonna go ahead and mix all of this together. As a kid, I'd always eat about half the mixture before we added in the rest of the ingredients. At this point, we're gonna go ahead and add in three eggs, but we wanna do them one at a time. I've been practicing my one-handed egg crack for many years now. Not necessarily for speed, it's more just a nice little trick to have up your sleeve. After this is well combined, I'm gonna go ahead and add in a little splash of vanilla extract. I have a homemade bottle of vanilla extract that I've been working with for a little over two years now. And then just a little splash of almond extract to give it that almond flavor that we're looking for in this biscotti. But you can really flavor yours however you like. Stir that up until combined. I've already combined my flour and baking powder in this bowl here, so I'm gonna go ahead and add that in. And then we wanna go ahead and mix this all together until it's just combined. I'm gonna go ahead and sprinkle in a generous amount of my slivered almonds. You can put as many or as little as you want. Whenever you're baking, as long as you're having fun, I feel like the rest doesn't really matter. Next up, we'll grab a parchment or sulfat lined sheet pan and go ahead and add that dough ball right into the center. Then we're gonna go ahead and shape this into a nice log. For biscotti, it's really not gonna change very much as it bakes. And to finish before baking, I also like to sprinkle a few slivered almonds right over the top. Then all we have to do now is bake until lightly golden and puffy, about 25 minutes at 375 Fahrenheit. This has been cooling for about 10 minutes, so I'm gonna go ahead and transfer it right onto the cutting board. So we're gonna cut at an angle here, slightly diagonally, and as we cut, aim to get about half inch slices. You can use a serrated knife for this portion if you like, but I sometimes just take one of my sharper knives and that makes it just as easy. Just make sure you're cutting at the proper time because if you let it cool for too long, it's gonna to be too dry and crumbly to actually cut. Once we finish slicing these, we're gonna go ahead and layer them out, cut side down, and you can use the very same parchment or sheet that you used to bake them the first time. Just make sure as you lay them out that you're leaving some space between each of them. All right, my favorite part. Once the biscotti have finished baking, I've let them cool, they've hardened, so it's time to see what they taste like. Oh my God. It's such a sweet, comforting, crumbly cookie, and that perfect combination of brown butter and almond is what really makes this a treat for me. I literally could eat biscotti any time of the day. All right, we'll be back soon with more holiday cookies from Layla Ali, Duff Goldman, and our very own Craig Melvin, making a twist on his mother's signature oatmeal raisin cookie.
Welcome back to the Great American Holiday Cookie Swap. The Northeast definitely brought the sweet holiday spirit. So let's see if our next region is ready to impress. We are headed south from Virginia to Kentucky, Florida to Louisiana. We are about to cover a huge portion of our country. Look out for cake guru Duff Goldman and our own Craig Melvin coming up soon. But let's kick things off with a true legend, Layla Ali with a sweet tribute to her father. Hello, I'm Layla Ali, and today I'm honoring my father, the greatest of all time, Muhammad Ali. I'm going to be making my knockout bourbon butter pecan chocolate chip cookies. So I'm going to show you how to be the champion of the holiday cookie swap. You ready to get started? All right, so first we're going to start with our dry ingredients. I have some one-to-one gluten-free all-purpose flour, and I'm going to add some baking soda. We're just going to mix these together until combined. And now I'm going to head over to the stove and make my bourbon butter pecan mixture. I'm going to go ahead and turn my stove on medium, add our butter to the pot. Let that start melting down. Putting the pecans in the pan like this, give them a chance to get infused with that brown sugar and that bourbon and that butter. And I'm telling you, all of these steps really make a difference as you're layering on the flavor of this cookie. Kentucky is known for their bourbon, so I had to make sure I included it in this cookie recipe. So my father actually didn't drink alcohol. So if I was making these cookies for him specifically, I probably wouldn't use the bourbon or I would use bourbon flavoring. It does cook off once you put it to the heat. And then of course, we're gonna put these cookies in the oven. But you know, it's dad, so I would make them his way. I'm gonna go ahead and let this cool for about 10 to 15 minutes. So now I'm gonna go ahead and start making the batter. So the first thing that I'm gonna do is I'm gonna add this room temperature butter into my bowl. And then I'm gonna add the butter mixture. Butter on butter. <laughs> and then I'm going to add my brown sugar, granulated sugar. Go ahead and give this a mix. And now we're gonna go ahead and add two eggs, some vanilla extract. And this batter is coming together really nicely. So now I'm gonna go ahead and fold in these dry ingredients. This cookie dough really start to form. Add our chocolate chips. I like to add a mix of milk chocolate and semi-sweet chocolate. So when I said that this recipe was inspired by one of my father's favorite treats, it's because he loved a good chocolate chip cookie. I can remember coming to visit him when he used to come in town, we'd come to the hotel and they'd be ordering room service and there were always cookies on the tray. Cookies and milk were some of my father's favorite treats. And now for the fun part, we're gonna go ahead and form our cookies. So what I like to do is just take a regular kitchen spoon and roll them into balls. And then I actually like to flatten them. Just standing here making these cookies brings back so many memories of my father. It's funny because there's so many ways that we are alike. I didn't want to embrace the butterfly and the bee, you know, with my father's famous saying, float like a butterfly, sting like a bee. But now that he's not here, I'm always trying to find ways to incorporate him into my life, even down to the butterfly logo. All right, so these cookies are done and ready to go in the oven. These cookies smell so good. And I know if my father was here to eat one, he would totally want two scoops of vanilla ice cream to go with this. So it would be cookies a la mode for him. <laughs> In fact, I like the size of this cookie because you can totally make an ice cream sandwich with them. These are my knockout bourbon butter pecan chocolate chip cookies. Try them because I know you're gonna love them. Up next, more sweet treats from the South. Hey, what's up everybody? I'm Duff Goldman and I have been operating Charm City Cakes out of Baltimore, Maryland since 2002. And today I am demoing a cookie from Baltimore that's been around for over a hundred years. So a burger cookie is like, it's kind of somewhere in between a cookie and a cake and it is piled high with frosting. So let's get started. The first thing we have to do is make the actual cookie. So what I'm gonna do is cream together some butter and some sugar. So here is five and a half tablespoons of butter, and here's the sugar. 
a little bit of salt. Always a little bit of salt. So I turn the mixer on. I'm going to start it slow so I don't want to make a big mess. And then once it gets going, I can really like speed it up. I have a screen. You can use any kind of mesh strainer. I'm just going to dump my flour in here and my baking powder. Isn't that satisfying? <laughs> Turn the mixer back on. And I'm gonna add about half the flour. I have an egg and some vanilla. So now I'm gonna add about half of that liquid. As much as you can, I mean, it's an egg. Now I'm gonna add the other half of the flour and then the rest of the egg mixture. So I have a cookie scoop here. Uh, this is like inch and a half, inch and a quarter, something like that. I'm gonna scoop some of the batter, then make sure you scrape it on the side of the bowl and really make sure that it gets flat on one side. Drop it onto the paper, just like that. So now what I like to do is once I have the cookies scooped out, I like to clean them up a little bit. So I put a little bit of water on my fingers and then any sort of like little thing that's sticking out, just kind of pat it back down like that. So these are going to go in the oven at 400 degrees on the middle rack for like seven to 10 minutes or so. You want to bake these until you just start to see a little bit of color right near the tray. So this is my chocolate frosting. It's just chocolate, cream, salt, uh, a little bit of corn syrup, melted on the stove, and now I'm just gonna add powdered sugar to it. And just spread just a tiny bit. You don't need a lot. Just spread some on the flat side of the cookie. And then we're gonna let that dry. Okay, there we go. So now, we're gonna let these cookies cool, then we're gonna let this frosting cool, and then we're gonna really add the correct amount of frosting. So now you're gonna put a ridiculous amount of frosting on it. That's, for me, what really makes burger cookies amazing is how much of the pretty sweet frosting. Sprinkle on top like that but you can also just dunk it in there, which is pretty amazing. All right, well, I got my whole family here and it is time to eat some cookies. Mm. Are you ready? Here you go. That one has the most frosting. Oh, that's for mommy. Yeah, that's for mommy. Yeah, yeah. A baby wants a cookie. Hey, You're welcome. Can I have a bite? Have a sweet holiday season. It's time to dig in. <laughs> <laughs> All right, the oven is warm and we've got more chefs ready to show off their signature holiday cookies. Stick around.
Welcome back to the first ever Great American Holiday Cookie Swap. We are kicking off hour number two of our marathon with even more amazing chefs from the South. Coming up, we've got not one, but two unique thumbprint cookie recipes, a cookie with candy bacon and a portable peach cobbler. Throughout the show, look for this QR code. It's at the bottom of your screen for recipes and more information on how you can give back this season. Feeding America, the country's largest network of food banks, is working to fight food insecurity. Scan your smartphone here to find out how you can donate to help fill plates and hearts this holiday season. Now, first up this hour, our very own Craig Melvin is sharing a special treat he's been enjoying for years. Hello, everyone. Uh, Craig Melvin here with my wife, Lindsay, my son, Delano, my daughter, Sybil. Many of you know that I'm a proud son of the great state of South Carolina, so we are going to pay tribute to my state and my family by making my mother's oatmeal raisin cookies, but we're gonna add a treat to make it especially Southern. We're gonna add pecans, or as you say, pecans. Let's do it, family. Lindsay's gonna start, start us off. She's our baking leader. All right, so the first thing is you start with a bowl, a big glass bowl, and you put in one cup of all-purpose flour. You wanna add that one in. Now, you add two teaspoons of baking soda and a half teaspoon of salt, and then you whisk that together. Oh, can I whisk that? Yeah. Before, but please, please slowly, just that slowly, out. be gentle. Now, we go to another large bowl with one stick of butter. You add your brown sugar, one cup of brown sugar. Brown Fun fact, that was my nickname in high school. It was. Yeah. Brown. Well, it comes back to brown sugar. Why'd they call right. you brown sugar? Put brown sugar in there. Put that in there, sir. Daddy, this A half cup of sugar to the brown sugar. And now you mix. But you gotta, you gotta hold it down, sir. You gotta, you gotta get in there. No, you're not licking anything here. We're making these cookies. You ready for your vanilla? A little vanilla. Two eggs. There you go. Okay. That, you know what? We'll, you will make that work. Sometimes it happens. Sometimes it happens. That's a, that, well, you got the yolk in. That's okay. But for you at home, you want two full eggs. So this, this does actually kind of remind me um, of, of what it was like making cookies uh, at home when I was a little boy, because it was, it was just as much of a disaster as this is. However, when the cookies were done, they magically were edible and tasty. Now it's time, kids, to add the dry ingredients. Let's add the dry ingredients. Gradually, mix, 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 mix. Sibby, you're doing a great job with the mixer. Yeah, much better with the mixer than the egg. Than me? No, never, so, never. I eat better at Equal. Now, after you've got that mixed together, we're gonna add the oats, three cups of oats. There you go, there you go. And then we're gonna put three fourths cup raisins and some chopped pecan. So where I'm from, it's pecan. Where I'm from, it's pecan, but also I say aunt and you say aunt. Uh, that's true. So I think that, um, but, and also, just a note, if you want these cookies without pecans or pecans, mm. they would be very tasty. Yes, if you have a nut allergy, sure. you, leave out, you leave out the pecans. This actually does bring back memories because looking at the, the batter here, that's exactly what I used to do. I used to, I used to taste a little bit of bit, a little bit of the batter, just a smidge. And my mom would only make these actually around the holidays. Like you didn't get these like in the middle of, of summer. This was a special holiday treat, so this is nice. I'm glad. The way to do this is you take a teaspoon and you spoon them out, and you want to make sure to put about two inches apart from one another on the parchment paper. These are a little rough around the edges. The balls don't have to be perfect. No what? cookie should be perfect. You guys do a great job. Great job, team. High five, girl. A fist pump, girl. Oh, look at that. No, I'm raising on the nose. Ha ha. These are going to go in the oven uh, 350 for about, we're talking somewhere between 11 and 13 minutes. And the cookies are done. And the cookies are done. Betty Joe's soon to be world famous oatmeal raisin pecan cookies. What's the word, guys? What do we think? How do, how do, how do they? I just need a little milk. Can you go get some milk? Sure. I'll get you some milk. Merry Christmas from our family to yours. Cheers. 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 Cookie cheers. <laughs> Hi, 
Today All Day. I'm Chef Maria Kemp and I'm repping the great state of North Carolina. To get into the Tar Heel spirit, we're making cherry chocolate chip cookies with a surprise. Bacon bits candy in cheer wine. They're sweet, salty, and a little bit savory. Cheer wine is a cherry flavored soda made right here in North Carolina and I like to serve it whenever there's anything to celebrate. So let's get started. Use a sheet pan, fit it with parchment paper for easy cleanup, and then put a wire rack on top. So I'm gonna put the bacon on the wire rack. And these are really long and thick pieces of bacon. So this is the step where we're gonna candy the bacon in the cheer wine syrup. And then we'll continue brushing the cheer wine on both sides. The bacon is out of the oven. You can see it's got a little bit of a glistening from the candied effect from the cheer wine. I wish you could smell it. But let's go ahead and start chopping it up. Now I'll go ahead and place it in the bowl and then we'll get started on the dry ingredients. And I'm gonna go ahead and cream up some butter, some granulated sugar and brown sugar and vanilla. And I'm gonna cream it until it's light and fluffy. Now you're going to add your eggs one at a time and you'll stop and scrape down the bowl as needed. Now we're going to go ahead and mix in our dry ingredients. We got our batter all ready, but now it's time to put in the best part, the add-in. So we've got our candied bacon here that's been candied in the cheer wine syrup. Let's not leave any behind. And then the next thing we'll add are dried cherries just enhancing that cherry flavor a little bit more for representing our home state well. And then last, oh well, almost last, we've got mini chocolate chips. These are semi-sweet chocolate chips. And then we've also got dark chocolate chips. Now it's time to scoop some cookies. So I'm gonna scoop the dough, and I always rub it along the inside of the pan, or the bowl just to make sure it's level. And as I drop these onto the parchment paper, I'm going to make sure the cookies are about two inches apart because they're going to spread in the oven and we don't want them to crash into each other. Now you're going to bake these in the oven at 375 degrees for about 8 to 11 minutes until they're light brown around the edges and have just a little color on top. Now look at when I break it, see that texture, it's a little chewy and I can see a luscious dry cherry there and the chocolate chips, oh and they smell so good. Happy holidays from my family to yours. Hi everyone, Elizabeth High School here. You know I'm representing the great state of Mississippi today. I've lived in Mississippi my entire life and there are a few things I love more than these chocolate pecan tassies. Growing up, I had pecan trees all over my yard and this was one of the best ways to use them. Y'all are gonna love this recipe. So we're gonna start with two eggs. We're gonna go ahead and get those beaten up and then we're just gonna add melted butter to it. We're also adding a little bit of cornmeal, a little bit of vanilla, and some salt. Once this is mixed thoroughly, we're gonna hop on over here to our stove. I already have some dark corn syrup in here, and I'm turning this all the way up because what we wanna do is bring this to a nice bowl. So we are gonna go all the way up with that, and then we're gonna add some white sugar, we're also going to add some brown sugar. And honey, then we're going to add a little bit of bourbon. <laughs> I wish I had a little bit more. A little shot wouldn't hurt anything right now. You know, that always helps with the holidays, doesn't, doesn't it? And while this is going, I'm going to give this one more whisk before we start to temper these eggs. And all that means is we just want to add a little bit of the boiling sugar to our eggs so that we don't curdle them, okay? So now we are at that boiling point, and you'll see what I'm doing. I'm just gonna add a tiny bit while I'm whisking, okay? We're slowly bringing this up to make sure that those eggs are perfect. Okay, perfect, we'll put that right back there. Give this a nice mix. 
So this is the consistency that we're looking for. It's almost like thin honey. Now we're gonna put this to the side and I'm gonna get ready to make my dough. So what we've got here, this is a mixture of flour, cream cheese, and butter. And then we rolled it into a nice disc and then put it in the refrigerator. And if you see, I'm just pinching and making almost like a marble sized ball. And then what we do is we take our finger and you wanna make sure that you pull this dough all the way up to the edges. When we add our filling, none of it's gonna seep over the side and you'll have a pretty tassie. This dough, to me, is one of the simplest doughs on the planet. So one of the great things about these tassies is that during the holidays, we are so busy and these freeze beautifully. So what we can do is go ahead and make them now, stick them in the freezer. I mean, they'll keep for a month, so you don't have to worry about them all. And honey, you are already ahead of the game. Okay, so here we go, and now we've got this finished. And now to my favorite part, the chocolate and the pecans. I'm gonna start with a few of these chopped pecans. Make sure that they're finely chopped, just because these tassies are so small. You just want these nice, chopped finely pecans. And then we're gonna use mini chocolate chips. And that's also gonna help because if we were using the big chocolate chips, it won't get mixed that well. Now, this is our filling. Make sure that you don't fill it too much because this filling does have a little tendency to bubble over. So very carefully add this in. Good. And now we're just gonna top with a few pecans. There we go. And now what we're gonna do is these are gonna go into a 350 degree oven for about 25 minutes until that center is set and the crust is golden brown. So we waited 10 minutes, which was hard to let them cool, but here they are. They are golden brown, perfectly set in the middle and ready for your holidays. Have a super sweet Christmas season, y'all. Man, those tassies look just like mini pecan pies or pecan pies. I can't wait to try those at home. We'll be right back after this. Welcome back to the Great American Holiday Cookie Swap. Next up, is everything really bigger in Texas? Chef Tiffany Derry is here to share a classic Southern recipe. Hey everyone, it's Tiffany Derry and I'm representing my home state of Texas. In Texas, we love our pecans. It's actually the state nut. Even the pecan pie traces its roots all the way back to Texas. 
Today I'm bringing you all of that sweet buttery goodness, but in a candy. Okay, first thing we're gonna do is put in our evaporated milk, our brown sugar. I'm using a light brown sugar and white sugar. So we're gonna let this cook at a medium high. Once it comes up to a boil, we're gonna cook it to at least 235 degrees. Um, and that's why I have my candy thermometer today to make sure that we hit that stage. If we don't hit that temperature, it won't harden when we get ready later to let it sit. I remember growing up, my grandmother would make it and it would take her all day to make these huge pots of pecan candy. It would be like five hours and we would have to take turns stirring and doing all of those things, but my grandmother would cook it really slow. As you continue to cook uh, the sugar and the milk mixture, you'll see that the colors are changing. You should see this really beautiful caramel color. It happens quick. If you mess it up, you just gotta start over. So I take the half pecans and I just slightly break them in my hand. I don't want them to be too big. And now we want the pecans to get a little bit of a bath in the sugar mixture so that the flavor of the pecans will now be in that caramel. We're gonna let that cook a little bit. We're gonna add a touch of salt here. We're gonna finish it with some butter, little orange zest, and vanilla extract. Orange zest is really my play on it. My family didn't do the orange zest in the beginning, but after I did it, they all love the flavor and love that it really kind of woke up the sauce. I'm gonna turn off the fire just for a second, what's gonna happen is that mixture is gonna thicken just a little, right? And then we're gonna scoop out little pecan candies. And you can make smaller, you can make larger ones. Um, I think this is a really good size. So now that we've cooked the pecan candy, we're gonna allow it to sit for 20 minutes to get firm. These look fantastic. These are a little warm right now, but right now I am so excited and oftentimes I really can't wait. And these are some of my favorite bites. Mmm. <laughs> I can't wait for you to make these. Delicious. That little orange and pecan. Mmm. Match made in heaven. Happy holidays, y'all. Hey everyone, Chef Jonathan Harrison here, coming to you from my home kitchen in Columbiana, Alabama. In my recipes, I love to highlight the wonderful cultures that have touched our food and defined modern Southern cuisine. Today, I'm baking up a twist on a classic Alabama dessert, Lane Cake Cookie Sandwiches. This coconutty, citrusy cake with a boozy bourbon kick was made famous by Harper Lee's To Kill a Mockingbird. And each ingredient here packs a major flavor punch. All right, y'all, let's dive in with this cookie dough. First up, we want a half a cup of softened butter going into our mixer. And we're gonna cream that together with half a cup of granulated sugar and some brown sugar. When that's light and fluffy, we're gonna take an egg and some vanilla and mix those in until they're well incorporated. Once that's well incorporated, we're gonna take our dry ingredients of all-purpose flour, baking soda, and salt, and we're gonna mix it in half at a time. And once that is well mixed, we're gonna add our Lane Cake Flavor Bombs. We've got toasted pecans, we've got bourbon-soaked raisins that have been soaked until plump, and then the bourbon has been poured off. And we're gonna mix that until it's just incorporated. Then you wanna grab a one ounce scoop and scoop these out onto an ungreased baking tray about three inches apart. Then into a 350 degree oven for eight to 10 minutes, just until they've flattened out and they're about two to three shades darker than they were when we put them in. All right, next up, we're gonna get started on our eggnog butter cream. We've got one cup of unsalted softened butter in our mixer here, and we're gonna get that nice and creamed up. So with this buttercream, we want to add one cup of confectioner sugar at a time on low speed, and then we wanna scrape the bowl as needed. And next up, we're gonna add all those Christmas flavors we love. We're gonna add two teaspoons of vanilla, orange zest, nutmeg, cinnamon, and a little bit of salt. 
All right, y'all, next up, it's time to assemble. We are gonna take two cookies of around the same size, and then we are going to grab our piping bag full of our eggnog buttercream. We are going to give it a little dollop in there, about two tablespoons. Take our other cookie, put it over the top. Next up, we're gonna add our bourbon caramel over the top, little drizzle. And find the touch, because these guys are pretty sweet, we're gonna add a little bit of flaky sea salt over the top. Mm. <laughs> you get all that Christmas flavor from that eggnog buttercream, that boozy bite from those bourbon soaked raisins and from that caramel. And it's chewy, it's delicious, it screams Christmas. You gotta give these a try, guys. Alabama Lane Cake Cookie Sandwiches. Don't go away, y'all. We'll be right back with more sweet treats from the South. Welcome back to today's Great American Holiday Cookie Swap. We are working our way through the South with more delightfully tasty takes on classic cookies. Hi everyone, Chef David Rose here. This holiday season, I'm making Georgia proud with my peach cobbler cookies topped with bourbon peach glaze. First things first, we have our flour that's sifted over here to the left. Now we're gonna add cinnamon, Salt, because salt is very important in whatever you're making, it amplifies whatever flavors are in the cookie. And baking powder, because you want your cookies to be nice and fluffy and rise, not be flat. So we have our whisk. Next up, what I have over here is I have some butter and I have some sugar. You wanna cream that till it's nice and incorporated. To this, I'm going to add a little bit of vanilla bean. The reason I'm using Fresh vanilla bean is because the flavor is more vibrant and give you that really extreme, in your face, upfront vanilla flavor. So we open up our bean with the knife and you just take the knife and just scrape out all the seeds. No vanilla bean seeds left behind, uh-uh. And just scrape out both sides. We wanna start the blending process out very slow as to keep all of the contents in the bowl where they belong, not on our shirt. So we add milk. As everything starts to come together, you kind of bring the speed up even quicker, but we're gonna go ahead and add some egg yolks in there. We wanna slow it back down because we cannot forget about our dry ingredients. So back to the flour we go. 
And into the bowl. Something about cookies and the holidays just really bring a smile to my face. And what we have here are our diced canned peaches in heavy syrup. So into this we go, little by little. And we don't want to crush or bruise or puree those peaches, so we're just folding it in. The very worst thing to happen is you're cooking, you're baking, the cookies look brown, they look delicious. You go to take them off, the cookies don't come off. So parchment lined baking sheet is a must. All right, and just place them on the parchment lined paper and about an inch apart from each other because the cookies are gonna spread. What I have here is I've reduced some bourbon and peach schnapps to about a third in volume. What that's gonna do, it's gonna intensify and volumize those flavors. What I have over here is that reserved peach heavy syrup, and I'm going to make a slurry. So what I'm doing right now is I'm gonna whisk a little bit of cornstarch into this. What I'm gonna add to our pan here now, to our reduced bourbon and peach schnapps, is that I'm gonna add brown sugar, to this, I'm gonna add also a whole stick of butter because we're making cookies. It's the holidays, so why skimp now? Whole stick of unsalted butter and a little bit of cinnamon because cinnamon, those nice baking spices are always found in a sweet Georgia peach cobbler. So we have it right now on about a medium high heat, just enough to get everything melted. We're gonna add a little bit of heavy cream for a nice little creamy note. And you want to reduce this down, you know, about two-thirds in volume until the heavy cream just incorporates with all that niceness that's in there. So once that comes up and that heavy cream starts to reduce a little bit, we take our slurry, which we've made, with the cornstarch and the peach heavy syrup, and we just bring that into our mixture. And just like that, you start to see it come together. Nothing left to it, but do it. All right, so start them up high and just glaze as much or as little as you like. You can't go too far in the South without finding bourbon or peach, and this cookie has both. And just drizzle all over. Mm. Now this is a cookie that has Georgia on my mind, in my heart, and most importantly, in my stomach. Merry Christmas, everybody. Hi, everyone. I'm Jennifer Mon. I'm from Little Rock, Arkansas. I'm a lifestyle blogger, chef, and mom of six. My grandmother raised her family on Gingerbread Lane right here in Little Rock. I've made a pine cone-shaped gingerbread cookie sandwich that I'm going to share that represents the state of Arkansas because we have a beautiful landscape of pine trees all across the state. So I'm excited and ready to go. Let's get to it. So we'll start by making the cookie dough. I have four cups of flour here and I'm going to add cinnamon. We'll add ginger and a little bit of allspice. We're also going to add cocoa powder and we have baking soda and salt. Now I'm just going to give this a quick stir to combine all of our ingredients. Now I'm just going to incorporate the honey and eggs. So we mix that until it's well incorporated. And now I'm going to add my dry ingredients. So now I'm going to roll out the dough and if it's easier, feel free to split some of it off to make it easier to work with. Okay, so now it is time to cut the pine cones. So you'll cut 24 of these pine cone shapes and then transfer to your baking pan. Once we transfer these over, we will emboss our cookies and create those perfect little pine cone edges. And as you make your pattern, you're going to overlap and you will only need to create the design on half of the cookies since this is a cookie sandwich, just the top cookie will need the design added. So now that we're done embossing, we're going to place these into an oven set for 350 degrees Fahrenheit. 
So now it's time to make the chai cream cheese frosting. It is so delicious, and if you love chai tea, you will love this recipe. But I've already added our butter and cream cheese and have creamed that together until it's light and fluffy. And then we are going to add our cinnamon, ginger, nutmeg, cloves, allspice, a little bit of vanilla. Now we'll add the powdered sugar and a little bit of salt. So we'll mix this until it is smooth and fluffy. Now it's time to assemble the cookies. I've transferred the icing to a piping bag here with an open star tip, and it's time to frost the cookies. You'll want to use about two tablespoons of icing per cookie. Now we'll add the embossed cookies on top and press gently to create the sandwich. And here is our pinecone gingerbread cookie sandwich. So delicious and so cute. Coming up, it's time to enjoy a taste of Florida with key lime cookies. And you don't want to miss a real throwback to childhood with a PB&J cookie. Welcome back to the Great American Holiday Cookie Swap. Up next, a vegan twist on a Southern classic. Hi there, it's Chef Danny Bowen here. I'm a Korean American chef who grew up in Oklahoma and I'm making one of my favorite Southern desserts. I'm thinking outside of the box by turning the divinity vegan, a recipe from a new cookbook, Mission Vegan. This sweet nougat treat will be a crowd favorite at the swap. So let's get started. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to make something called aquafaba. Aquafaba is essentially an egg replacement. This recipe typically calls for egg whites. And what we're going to do is we're going to whip the juice of a can of chickpeas into a nice stiff peak. And you want to start this out at a little bit lower speed until you get some micro bubbles. And you just want to monitor this. You'll start to see the bubbles form on the outside as they start to like populate towards the center, then you know that you're ready to increase the speed. So we're getting a lot of like nice bubbles forming here. What you basically want it to do is you want it to really hold its form. So at this point, um, it's finished. Sugar syrup should not be intimidating. The most important part is to have a really good candy thermometer. Put your water in your pot, get it up a little bit past the simmer to a medium heat. You're gonna add your sugar first. and then you'll add your corn syrup. Okay, just mix that together until you feel there are no clumps. 
So the temperature we're trying to take this to is around 250 to 255. Hardball stage sugar is between the temperatures of 250 to 265. Basically hardball stage of sugar is when you cook a sugar solution or sugar syrup to where it can be formed into a ball. So now we're at the um, hardball stage. I'm gonna take this off the heat. I'm going to add the vanilla extract to the aquafaba and turn this back on to like a medium. We're gonna slowly drizzle in the sugar syrup in a thin, steady stream. It's gonna take anywhere from three to five minutes. I think a good indicator also visually is it should kind of look like a buttercream if you make frosting. I'm gonna get a spatula and scrape off as much of this as you can. And it will be a little sticky. Fold in your pine nuts and pecan. And then from here, you're gonna just offload it onto a um, oiled sheet tray. And the oil, what it's gonna do, it's going to help you dip your fingers in, it's gonna help you spread this evenly. So we cue the, the nougat spreading music. <laughs> And you want to make sure this is about a half inch thick. I'm just going to let it set uncovered overnight to firm up. All right, so we have our fully set divinity. It's definitely firmed up. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm just going to cut it into nice squares. So here you have it. These are my vegan divinities from Oklahoma. So good. Hi everybody, I'm Chef Therese Gregoire, but you can call me Chef T. My family hails from a tiny island in the Caribbean called St. Vincent, and my grandmother was actually a peanut farmer. I remember as a kid being so excited when she brought home that haul of green peanuts. Fast forward several years and I moved to Virginia. The taste of the Virginia peanut just brought back so many memories. So today, I'll be making peanut and jelly thumbprints. Virginia is for peanut lovers, y'all. Let's get started. I started with my mixer fitted with a paddle attachment, and I'm going to cream my room temperature butter and brown sugar together. You just want to mix about two to three minutes. You're just incorporating a lot of air into your butter and sugar. I have separated uh, the eggs. The yolks are going into the dough and the whites will be used a little bit later. I've got two cups of flour and I'm gonna incorporate it until it's fully mixed in. So now we're gonna shape, coat, and bake our cookies. Super easy. I'm using a small cookie scoop. Um, the scoop is gonna be about the size of a melon baller. I'm gonna scoop my cookies onto a uh, baking sheet or cookie sheet and I've lined it with uh, some parchment. I have my egg whites that I separated earlier and uh, I'm going to whisk them until they're foamy. We are going to roll our cookie dough. They shouldn't be too tacky. You can use the egg whites as an adhesive to coat your cookies. This is the fun part. You can drop them right in. You can use your hands. This is the part where you get the kids involved. And now you just roll them in crushed peanuts. So I use a food processor for this. Um, to get the peanuts down. You just want to make sure that it's where it's crushed evenly. I have my oven set to 375. I've placed the coated dough rounds on a parchment lined sheet pan. And uh, I'm going to bake these cookies for five minutes until they are slightly puffy. Now we're going to go ahead, add the jam and make and bake again. So we're just going to press right in the middle of the cookies to create a well for the jam. Now I'm using grape preserves. You can uh, buy them store-bought or you can make your own. I love making my own because I can splash a little bit of wine in there. Virginia is for peanut and wine lovers, in case you didn't know. I'm gonna bake them until they're golden brown, eight to 10 minutes more at 375. Voila, these cookies look amazing. Have a holly jolly holiday, guys.
Hey everyone, I'm Chef Michelle Bernstein, chef and restaurateur of Cafe La Trova and La Cañita here in Miami. Today I'm representing the Sunshine State, and of course no dessert speaks to South Florida more than the perfect key lime pie. So I've created my own recipe for the key lime pie cookie. It hits all notes in your palate. It's like sweet versus tart versus creamy and of course crunchy. And I just think it's perfect and less fuss because it's in a cookie. So the first thing we're gonna do is make the curd. So we're gonna go ahead and add uh, yolk and eggs into a little saucepan here, as well as some sugar. We have to add condensed milk. It makes everything just so creamy. So now I'm just gonna add lime juice. Now this is fresh squeezed lime juice. It's really important that the lime juice is fresh because every key lime pie should always be made with freshly squeezed lime juice. I'm gonna go ahead and head to the stove, but I'm taking my whisk with me because we have to warm this and turn it into an actual curd. All right, so the next thing we need to do uh, for the curd is the butter, that is the last ingredient. So mix that in. So once the butter has melted thoroughly into our curd, we're gonna go ahead and strain it. I use a mesh strainer, takes a little bit of muscle to get that through, but I promise you this is the hardest part of the recipe. Great, now you need a piece of plastic because what you're gonna do is touch the plastic wrap directly to the curd, making sure we don't have any bubbles, making sure that we don't get a skin. All right, so let's go ahead and make the cookie. So this is just regular granulated sugar. And I've decided to make it a little creamier by adding cream cheese and butter. Let's combine and make it really creamy. Once everything is really creamy as it is, I'm gonna go ahead and add egg, some vanilla paste, and I'm gonna zest a lime into this mixture. Now we're gonna just combine the two dry ingredients. So we have graham cracker crumbs, a little bit of salt, Go ahead and mix those two together really well. And I'm just gonna throw this all into the creamed egg butter cream cheese mixture. And all you have to do is uh, use your hands to roll. And all you have to do is roll them into little balls, place them down. And of course, this takes a little while. So I actually have a sheet pan ready. Thank you. Press into the cookie very lightly to make a little divot. Let's do that again. After we have our little divots, we're gonna go into a 350 degree oven to bake. So these cookies just came out of the oven. You see how they're nice and golden. So I just shut the oven off, but we're gonna go back in the oven once the curd is placed into the cookie. Remove the plastic wrap from your curd, and we're gonna go ahead and fill the cookies with the curd in those little divots that we made. And going back into the now off oven, but still warmed oven, is going to allow them to set. The curd has set beautifully. Look how gorgeous they are. Just like key lime pie, but so much easier. Merry Christmas and Happy Hanukkah. Looks good. Thanks so much, Chef. We'll be right back.
Welcome back to the Great American Holiday Cookie Swap. Up next, Chef Valerie Lomas is sharing a sweet treat from Louisiana. Hey everyone, I'm Valerie Lomas and I'm here to celebrate my home state of Louisiana. Growing up in Baton Rouge, there is no holiday season without sweet potatoes. So I'm bringing the Southern staple to the cookie swap this year with my sweet potato cookies. They are fluffy and rich, adding that cozy feeling to your table. The first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna whisk my dry ingredients together. I've got flour and I'm gonna add some baking soda, baking powder, a little bit of salt, and some pumpkin spice. This is just a blend of cinnamon and nutmeg and I like it because it makes things a little bit easier when I wanna make cookies pretty quickly. I creamed my butter, sugar, and brown sugar. And to really add some something to bring out the sweet potato flavor, we're gonna add orange zest. It's nice to add something that has a little bit of acid and citrus because it does balance the flavors. So I'm gonna go ahead and beat my orange zest into my creamed butter and sugars. I can already smell that orange zest, definitely giving me the holiday feels. So now I'm gonna add my egg, vanilla extract, and my sweet potato. I roasted a sweet potato and mashed it to get this sweet potato puree. So I've added my sweet potatoes, egg, and vanilla, and I'm gonna go ahead and beat this. I just want this to be nice and combined. So I'm adding my dry ingredients in about three additions. And just mixing on low so the flour doesn't get all over my holiday sweater. <laughs> and I can tell my dough is really starting to come together. One of the great things about this cookie dough is as soon as it's done, we can go ahead and scoop it and bake it. This cookie dough is actually quite fluffy. It's not very dense. That's thanks to our star ingredient, the sweet potato. We're gonna bake these at 375 degrees for 11 to 13 minutes. So I pulled these out of the oven and I let them cool on a cooling rack. So now it's time to taste them. Mm. They are so good. So much holiday in one little bite. Have a sweet and tasty holiday season. Hi, I am Monique Chauhan and I'm representing the great state of Tennessee. We moved here around nine years ago. We have three restaurants, breweries, raising our family over here. The first time I tasted the Tennessee sandwich cookie, it was like, wow. I decided to take this cookie and make it my own by putting a twist of where I have come from. So there are Indian spices in it and paying homage to my new home, Tennessee. Let me show you how to make this delicious cookie. So I have the dough pre-made. We do need to chill it for an hour before we roll it out. Now, we'll take the cookie dough and go ahead and roll it out. So once this is done, we go ahead and use the cookie cutter to cut it into rounds. So our cookies are ready to be baked. So the next step in making these delicious cookies is to make the filling. So I have some marshmallow cream over here. To this, I am going to be adding some of my favorite flavorings. So start off with dried rose petals. Then I'm going to be adding some pistachio dust. So all I've done is taken some unsalted pistachios and gone ahead and ground it. Just a touch of salt just makes it a complete rounded flavor. And then we go ahead and mix it. Now we are going to take the marshmallow filling and pipe some in the center. When I do this, I go ahead and put a block and then stop. Do not spread it. When you're pressing the cookie on top, that's the time it's going to spread all over. So right over here, press it. So this is what we are looking for. So now that our sandwich cookies are chilling, we're going to go ahead and make a chocolate coating to it. So I'm going to take the dark chocolate and put it in a double boiler. Just look at this. 
So at this stage, I am going to be adding some vegetable oil right over here. And then we are going to add some Tennessee whiskey. We are ready to go. So I'm going to go ahead and take this cookie, put it in the chocolate. Make sure that you have two forks with you. Flip the cookie over. Pull it out and then put it on a sheet pan. Before it sets, I go ahead and put some beautiful toppings on it. We will put it in the refrigerator for around 15 minutes to let the chocolate harden. So here we have it, our Tennessee Whiskey Sandwich Cookies. Not only do they look absolutely beautiful, I mean just look at this, they are really delicious. Mm. The Great American Holiday Cookie Swap on Today All Day continues right after this. Coming up, we have more Southern chefs sharing their favorite recipes. Then it's off to the Midwest. Hello, I am Mike Costello. And I'm Amy Dawson. And today we're coming to you from Lost Creek Farm in West Virginia. So today, in honor of West Virginia's state fruit, which is the Golden Delicious Apple, we are making apple butter thumbprint cookies with some of the apple butter that we make here at the farm with some of the heritage varieties that grow here in our orchard. All right, so we're actually gonna start this recipe with the black walnuts, and we've ground those to kind of a pretty fine consistency here. And we're gonna toast them in a lightly greased, heavy bottom skillet. The black walnut trees are prevalent here on the farm. Compared to the standard English walnuts that you might be more familiar with, the black walnuts have such an interesting flavor. They have a little bit of bitterness to them, almost like a funk. When I'm toasting these black walnuts, it takes me about three to four minutes for the process from start to finish. All right, so now it is time to make our dough. And we're gonna start off with uh, some butter and sugar that we've already creamed. So the next step is we're gonna add a couple beaten eggs. And to that mixture of eggs, we're gonna add just a little bit of vanilla extract. Go ahead and mix that in. And then we're gonna gradually add that mixture into 
the butter and sugar. Uh, so this is a mix of all-purpose flour, buckwheat flour, and just a little bit of salt. And we like to use the buckwheat flour because it adds a little bit of flavor and texture. And it works pretty well with these toasted walnuts that we're gonna add. All right, so now we're gonna start to shape our cookies. Push between our hands and roll it into a nice perfect sphere. We're just gonna roll each of these balls of dough in some straight sugar. And I'm gonna just evenly press the back of that teaspoon into the center of each cookie. Now, of course, as the name suggests of this recipe, you can use your thumb for this step if you want. So now we have our cookies shaped. We have our holes ready to be filled with apple butter. You could think of it as a, a thicker, smoother applesauce that's been seasoned. So I'm just gonna almost overfill a little bit because that jam is gonna bake down. So these are ready to bake now. And we're gonna put them into an oven at about 350 degrees, 10 minutes. All right, so these cookies have baked and they have cooled. There's an additional optional step that we really like to employ here, and that is just dusting them with a little bit of powdered sugar. Cheers. The perfect holiday snack. It's a nice taste of West Virginia with the apple butter and the black walnuts. We hope you have a delicious Christmas season. Hi, today on day, Chef Mark Quinones here. Growing up in the South Bronx, I learned everything I had to learn about life by watching my mother and grandmother cook her Puerto Rican dishes that I can never forget about. You can't think of Puerto Rico in the holidays without drinking coquito. So I created an eggnog coquito cookie. We're gonna start by adding the flour, add the baking soda, baking powder, kosher salt, nutmeg, I, I feel like I feel like whenever I add the cinnamon, it just like, it begins to smell very holiday-ish. Next up, we're going to add our butter. So, coquito, the way I know it to be, is essentially spiked eggnog. So you have an eggnog, and you have some Puerto Rican rum, and you have coquito. I feel like right now the dough's coming together just fine. You want it to kind of be uh, loose and flaky like this. When you add your egg, you want to have texture. I'm out of here the corn syrup, add your heavy cream. So at this point, I'm going to roll that out and then I'm going to take some cookies. One of my favorite techniques I like to use, believe it or not, the bottom half of my palm. And the reason why is because, once again, it gives you leverage. I'm going to sheet pan and I'm going to have a little more flour from the bottom of that. Just to make sure that dough doesn't stick. And you're going to put your dough right in that sheet. When it comes out of the uh, fridge, we're gonna cut the cookie bump out with the bowl. Let's go ahead and cut some cookies out right now. I like round, it works for me. Uh, use whatever shape you like. Lay them down on your parchment lined sheet pan. Preheat your oven to 350 degrees. I, I always bake for at least 12 minutes and I look at them. For no longer than 15 minutes, let's make the icing. Powdered sugar, cinnamon sugar, and the rum. Coconut cream, just mix it. Oh wow, beautiful. You're gonna put a small amount in the middle of the cookie, and you're gonna work your way to the outer edges, and you're gonna stop before you get there because you're gonna add the toasted coconut on top as well. So, and literally just kind of go like that. And oh my god, look, look. It just screams holidays, it screams Puerto Rico, and it screams good times. And then I'm going to come over here and add some more coconut over the top. This is so good. This is so Puerto Rican. And let me tell you right now, this was so much fun. Happy holidays from my family to yours. Well, we are officially at the halfway point of today's great American holiday cookie swap. So far, we've been down the East Coast and traveled through the South. 
Well, next up, it's the Midwest. This region is home to some pretty cold winters, so it's no surprise that we've got a ton of cozy cookies coming up. And don't forget to scan the QR code below for all of these recipes that you see here, plus information on how you can help Feeding America battle food insecurity this holiday season. Well, let's kick things off with country legend Martina McBride making a no-bake treat from her childhood. Hey everybody, it's Martina McBride here and I'm so excited to share a very special treat from my home state of Kansas. Growing up, my high school had the best lunch ladies and they made everything from scratch. Our lunch ladies were Thelma, Betty, and Virginia, which are just the perfect lunch lady names. I can't think of better ones. And when they made these no-bake cookies for lunch, we all were so excited because they're so delicious. So we're gonna start with some melted butter. And to this melted butter, we add some sugar and a little bit of milk. And then we're just gonna stir this and mix it well. These cookies are so easy, and there's no baking, so they're super easy to whip up during the holidays. We'll let that boil for about a minute and a half. I have a cookbook called Martina's Kitchen Mix, and this recipe is in the book. And when I was testing this recipe, I brought it out on the road with me and gave it to my band and crew. They taste tested a bunch of stuff for me and this was a unanimous keeper. They were like, you have to put that in the book. This is a really good recipe to make with little kids because it's, it's very easy and they can have fun mixing everything in. Now we're just gonna quickly add all of the ingredients. We have some quick cooking oats, some chocolate. You can use milk chocolate or dark chocolate. Some peanut butter. I don't think this was in the lunch lady's recipe, but I kind of tweaked this over the years and I added peanut butter because I love chocolate and peanut butter together. Some vanilla and a little bit of salt. And then we're just gonna mix that all up. Incorporate everything in there together. Oh, this chocolate and peanut butter smells so good. It's really one of my favorite flavor combinations. Oh, this smells just like the lunchroom in high school. Once we have all those mixed up, we're just gonna take a scoop and put them out on a cookie sheet lined with some parchment paper. They really don't spread, they retain their shape, so you can put as many as you want on here, as many as you can fit on the tray. I mean, how easy is that? And then you just wanna let these cookies sit and set up for about 20, 30 minutes. You don't have to put them in the refrigerator, you can just keep them on the counter. And here's the finished cookie. They're really easy to package up for friends for a holiday gift. They're also great if you're doing like a Christmas buffet or a cookie swap to taste one. Mmm, so good. They're like creamy. These are so delicious. The peanut butter and the chocolate, a little texture from the oats, absolutely delicious and so easy. Merry Christmas, everyone. Happy holiday season. Hey everyone, I am David Burka, and I'm sharing some of my favorite flavors from my home state of Michigan with my cherry pistachio oat cookies. These cookies will keep you cozy and warm while the snow piles up outside. So let's get baking. We've got some flour, some baking soda, some cinnamon for that holiday flavor, salt. We're just gonna whisk that up. That's ready, and then we're gonna start creaming our butter. So we've got our butter, then we're gonna add our white granulated sugar, and then some brown sugar as well, and get that cream creamed nice and fluffy. We want it to be pale in color. And while that's going, we're gonna add in one large egg, vanilla, some milk, and some maple syrup from Michigan. When it starts getting cold outside, you could see the taps in the trees. It was a really fun, nostalgic thing from Michigan to see these great, beautiful maples being tapped for syrup. Now that that's done, we are going to add in our dry ingredients. 
Very important to scrape down the sides as you go. So you incorporate all that flavor. So everybody in my family has a favorite cookie. My husband likes these peanut butter cookies that I make. My daughter likes anything with like rainbow sprinkles. My son Gideon really loves this recipe. Uh, he's a big fan of cherries. He's a big fan of uh, the nutty flavor. He likes making them because he loves cookie dough. That's one of his favorite go-tos is raw cookie dough. But you know, you don't want to let, the, let them eat that too much because it gets a stomach ache. Now this is the fun part. So we're gonna add in our pistachios. I like using whole pistachios because you get that nice bite of the nut. You can cut them, there's really no rules in this. Um, same with the cherries, Michigan cherries. Uh, this is a really great ingredient because it gives you sweetness and some color for the holidays. Next, I'm gonna add the oats in. When I first started dating Neil, we took a trip up to Traverse City with my parents and they have a cherry festival every year upstate in Michigan. I was coerced into entering a cherry pie eating contest and guess what? I won. I won the cherry pie eating contest and it sealed the deal. So these are nice incorporated and uh, now it's time to get scooping. I don't like to roll these out. I just put them on the tray like this with a one ounce scoop and right on the pan there. I like to put on at least eight here because they do spread in the oven. They tend to be a bigger cookie. So we're gonna let this chill for 15 minutes. Then we're gonna put it into an oven at 375 degrees for eight to 12 minutes until golden brown. Okay, so I pulled these cookies out and they're cooled. And now it's time for the icing. We're gonna add some milk and some powdered sugar here to make the glaze. It's a thicker glaze and you just incorporate the milk and the powdered sugar. It's not necessary to have the glaze for these cookies, but I just like the way it looks. But you can eat them just like this. So now I'm just gonna take the talons of a fork and drip a zigzag motion on these cookies. We do a really fun cookie decorating party when the kids were young to now. It's really, really fun to get your kids involved to decorate sugar cookies and then they go to sleep and then you take their cookies that they sort of screwed up on and then redo them <laughs> as adults. Here are my cherry pistachio oat cookies. You can eat them after dinner or what I like for breakfast. Merry Christmas. Mm. Up next, more sweet treats from my personal friend, Christina Tosi from Ohio. Hey everyone, it's Chef Christina Tozzi here at Milk Bar. Now, I was born in Ohio and grew up loving Buckeye cookies. Buckeyes, if you don't know, were invented in Ohio in the 1960s, and they're the perfect combo of decadent chocolate with salty, sweet peanut butter. In dessert terms, a Buckeye is like a peanut butter fudge round that's dipped a little bit more than three quarters of the way in chocolate. These chocolate peanut butter diamonds pack that same punch of flavor and nostalgia, but they have a few riffs. Now, I love this recipe because it's both what I call accidentally gluten-free and dairy-free, so anyone and everyone can eat it. So first I start by toasting some Rice Krispies just really lightly in the oven to get a little bit of color, pull out a little bit more flavor. I take those pre-toasted Rice Krispies, put them just in a nice Ziploc baggie and break them down with a little bit of a rolling pin just to bring them down a little bit in size. What's also really cool about this recipe is it's a type of cookie that I call a no-bake, which means aside from toasting the Rice Krispies in the oven, you really don't have to turn on the oven at all. Now to your peanut butter, you're going to add some melted coconut oil. For me, peanut butter is synonymous with both something salty and sweet. So we need both the confectioner's sugar, which is gonna help in the sweet department, and a little bit of salt. And as everything comes together, you get to add your Rice Krispies. We're gonna toss these ingredients together just until they form what looks basically like a cookie dough. The holiday season is a, an especially I don't know, poignant time of year for me as a home baker first and as a pastry chef. A 
as bakers, we love to bake. That's, that's our very reason for being. When we're off the clock at Milk Bar, we throw something called a holiday cookie swap, where every single one of us brings our favorite holiday cookie. It's just a really special time to get to know someone through that cookie recipe that they've carried with them all through their life. It's usually something nostalgic and based on where they're from. Once your peanut butter, coconut oil, confectioner sugar, salt, with those crispies folded in, mass comes together, you just transfer it to an eight by eight inch pan. Now, I like to line my eight by eight inch pan in just a sheet of plastic wrap. It helps make sure that because this cookie isn't actually going into the oven, that when we're done with it, it's really easy to lift up and out. You want a nice even spread of this peanut butter crispy element. So you can use a knife, a new spatula. You can also use the palm of your hand, uh, the palm of your hand wrapped in a little plastic wrap so that you don't get too much peanut butter <laughs> going on your fingertips. But one nice solid smooth mass. Next step is to melt down some semi-sweet chocolate just until it's a nice smooth fluid state. I like to test my chocolate both for smoothness and for temperature by just lifting it up over my eye, no chunks, no lumps. We're gonna add a little bit more peanut butter to this melted chocolate. And what that's gonna do is it's gonna give us a really nice chocolate top that's not so hard to crack when you go to slice it or most importantly, when you go to eat it. From here, you're gonna take this gorgeous mass and put it in the fridge or the freezer until it's nice and firm, two, three, four hours. So once it comes, out of your fridge or freezer, you'll notice that the chocolate is set really nicely. It, it should lift up really easily as one solid piece. And then I just transfer it to a cutting board. From here, I like to slice the edges of the chocolate peanut butter mass off. Those are snacks for you. <laughs> then I start by slicing in rows. From here, you're basically going to cut your rows at an angle. That's gonna give you that beautiful diamond shape. A little bit of flaky salt I find really helps make that moment, that Buckeye moment, that ode to Ohio, my hometown, the Buckeye State. Just a little bit more of what it is, a little more special, but this is it, my chocolate peanut butter diamond. Oh, every time. <laughs> I cannot wait to serve these at our Milk Bar Holiday Cookie Swap, and I can't wait to see you bake them at home. I mean, you can never go wrong with chocolate and peanut butter, right? Coming up, we will continue through the Midwest with chefs from Illinois, Indiana, and Minnesota.
Welcome back to the Great American Holiday Cookie Swap. We are working our way through America's heartland, the Midwest. Next up is Chef Connie Lovely Jackson, paying homage to a city she loves, Chicago. Hey, my loves, I'm Chef Lovely, representing the Prairie State, Illinois. Growing up in Chicago, Christmas time was not complete until you took a trip downtown to Garrett's Popcorn. The aromas of the classic cheddar and caramel flavors fill the city air for blocks. So, in honor of that tasty tradition, I'm making one of my favorites, Chicago mixed cookies. The ooey gooey caramel in this cookie combined with the cheddar popcorn on top, mmm, it's the perfect balance of salty and sweet. But enough talking, my mouth is watering, so let's get baking. First step, take your flour and your baking soda, put it in a bowl, give it a good whisk, and then set it to the side. Inside of my stand mixer here, I have seven tablespoons of butter flavor shortening. Now that's because I want to intensify this rich buttery flavor and I want a nice tender cookie. Here I have my cooled brown butter. Put this in a saucepan over medium low heat. It's gonna take about five to seven minutes. Let it cool completely and then I'm adding that right in with my shortening. And let's give this thing a whip around for about five minutes. I have light brown sugar, about a half a cup there. We have white granulated sugar, also a half a cup. And then a little pinch of salt, one fourth teaspoon. We want to season our sweets. Next, one egg. If it can be room temperature, that's gonna be perfect, my love. So one room temperature egg goes right in. And then to give it a little floral sweetness, I have some vanilla bean paste. Now here we go again. We gotta give it another mix. Another two to three minutes on medium speed. Vanilla bean paste, it does cost a little bit extra money, but it has a wonderful flavor payoff. The aroma, the gentle kiss of sweetness, it's definitely worth it for this Chicago mixed cookie. Now let's add our dry ingredients. Now this time it only needs about 30 seconds to come together. You just don't want to see any of the white streaks here. And don't give yourself a flower shower. Start on low and then gradually increase. Don't lick the beaters. I know you're tempted. Don't lick it. All right, now we add in the fun. So I have some caramel here. Next, I have some milk chocolates. And last, for a little crunch, a little texture, some chopped pecans. And with your spatula, go in by hand and just give it a really good mix. Now we need to get them on a parchment lined or silpat lined baking sheet. Go ahead, take your scoop. And we're gonna make sure they're about two inches apart on the cookie sheet. This is gonna make sure that they don't touch while they're baking. And because we're using a cookie scoop, all of the cookies are gonna be the same size. That's my little pro tip. I'm gonna pop these in the oven. They're gonna take about 12 minutes and when they come out, the fun is gonna continue. While it's still warm, I want you to gently and carefully take a round cutter, because if you're like me, you love a perfectly round cookie. Put this right on top of the cookie, and it should be slightly larger than the cookie as well. Put it right on the center here, and just give it a go around in a nice circular motion. Now, that little bit of Chicago, that Garrett's cheddar popcorn, and if you don't have Garrett's, that's okay, just use your favorite cheddar popcorn. While the caramel is still nice and gooey and warm on top, it's gonna act as our glue. Take about three or four pieces and give it a gentle push right into the cookie and just pop it right on top. And then have a little snack too. Mmm, so good. You can use the caramel popcorn as well if you want a little extra crunch and variety. Fully with a little spatula, take your cookies, transfer it to a cooling rack so that they cool down completely. Your friends and family are gonna absolutely love these cookies, so make the entire batch, let them cool, and then go in, take a bite, and share the love. Happy holidays.
today all day, it's Ariana Fagan. In 2013, I had the life-changing opportunity to compete on season six of the show MasterChef Junior, and today I'm still sharing my passion for cooking on TikTok, making everything from mac and cheese to creme brulee. But my favorite recipes take me back to my childhood home in Minnesota. I'm the oldest of five siblings, and one of my fondest winter memories is going sledding with them on this little hill we had in our backyard. We would come inside with our cheeks red from the cold, and it was tradition for me to whip up a big batch of hot chocolate, which we would have together with some candy canes and tons of marshmallows, and that's the flavor combination that inspired these peppermint hot cocoa cookies. First up, in a large bowl, we're going to crack two eggs. And then we're going to add in our brown sugar. And using an electric mixer, we're going to whip this all up. I have some melted chocolate and butter, and I'm going to pour that in there. And then we're going to go back in with the electric mixer and whisk until everything is fully combined. Already smells so good. Here we have our dry ingredients. It's just a little bit of flour, salt, baking powder, and cocoa powder. It should be nice and smooth and look almost like brownie batter, a little thinner than your traditional cookie dough. And now we're going to go in with our chopped chocolate chunks. And then here I have some vanilla extract. And then we're going to add our peppermint extract, which is going to give these their signature peppermint hot cocoa flavor. And there we have it. Now that our dough's ready, we can cover it in plastic and pop it into the fridge for 30 to 60 minutes, and I will be back then to shape and bake the cookies. I just pulled my dough out of the fridge, and now we can add it to our parchment lined baking sheet. We're gonna just grab a pinch of the dough. It should fit in the palm of your hand, and we're gonna roll it into balls. Okay, and now we can pop these into the oven at 325 degrees for about 10 minutes. After about 10 minutes, I pulled these out of the oven and then topped them with half of a marshmallow and popped it back into the oven for about four minutes. And the marshmallows get all toasted and gooey and after they're cool, it's time to decorate. We're gonna decorate with a drizzle of chocolate, which I just melted in the microwave. And finally, we're gonna top with some crushed candy canes. This gives these a beautiful pop of color and just makes them feel so festive. These look so delicious, I can't wait to share them with my siblings. Happy holidays from Minnesota. Cheers. Mmm. Looks good, thanks chef. Stick around because up next, we head to Indiana and Wisconsin.
Welcome back and thanks for joining the Great American Holiday Cookie Swap on Today All Day. We're continuing our journey through the Midwest. So let's head to Indiana for a recipe that honors a popular state dessert, sugar cream pie. Hey everyone, I'm Chef Kelsey Murphy, owner of Inspo Restaurant in Indianapolis. Today I'm making sugar cream sandwich cookies, a fun mashup of two Hoosier State staples, sugar cream pie and a pork tenderloin sandwich. With a creamy filling rolled in crunchy bacon bits, this cookie is the perfect sweet and salty treat. So let's get baking. I already have my chilled dough here. I let this chill for about an hour, and this really helps make it easier to roll the dough and just to work with it. It also helps deepen those flavors, um, like that maple syrup that we put into the cookie dough. I'm gonna take my cinnamon and my nutmeg and just stir these together with the sugar until it's all combined and incorporated. And then I like to use an ice cream scoop when I'm making my cookies. It just, one, it makes it easier to get the dough out of the bowl, and two, it more ensures that your cookies are all going to be the same size. And then I just roll this into the sugar mixture and put it right on my lined baking sheet. So this cookie is actually just like a snickerdoodle cookie because it contains baking soda and cream of tartar in the dough. We're just kind of jazzing it up with a little maple syrup and making it a little spicy. The cream of tartar and the baking soda together make the cookies super fluffy, um, chewy, and they, it adds this kind of nice acidic bite to it um, that makes it different than a regular sugar cookie. So now we're gonna flatten the cookies really quick before we put them into the oven. I don't like to flatten them all the way, but just press them just lightly with the palm of your hand. It kind of just, again, so if your circles weren't perfect, it kind of just evens everything out. And then we're all set. These go in the oven right now, nine minutes, 350 degrees. While our cookies are baking, we're gonna start making our frosting for the sandwich cookies. I like using cream cheese frosting for this cookie because it really plays down the sweetness a little bit, especially when you're eating two cookies with filling and the bacon. We have our stand mixer and we have four ounces of cream cheese in there. And to that, we're gonna add butter. And then we're gonna go ahead and add some vanilla, some salt. And then we are gonna go ahead and blend this together. And now we're gonna slowly add our powdered sugar. I'm gonna crank this up a little higher to make sure that cream cheese is super smooth. And we're done. It's a perfect consistency, nice and smooth and creamy. It's not too fluid, um, but it's also not too stiff. Here I have my finished cookies fresh out of the oven. I let them cool on a cooling rack for about 15, 20 minutes until they're at room temperature. And we're gonna take some of our frosting and we're gonna dollop it on the cookie. We want a good helping of frosting on there so we have enough that it'll um, have the bacon bits stick all around it. So we're gonna take this, we're gonna take another cookie and sandwich it just like that. And now the fun part, we get to roll it in some bacon bits. So I previously made some bacon, I put it on a sheet tray and I baked it at 400 degrees for about 15 minutes until it's nice and crunchy, let it cool. And then I just take a knife to it and um, break it all up into these bite-sized little pieces. So I'm gonna take a little bit of my bacon bits and just cover the sides of the sandwich cookie. And then we just plate it right on our platter and we continue assembling. I am so ready to dive into these. Guys, oh, these are even better than they look. And the cookies have a perfect chew and bite to it super creamy super delicious and then the crunchy and salty bite of the bacon on the outside you have to try these at home have a super sweet christmas season hey everyone i'm jen barney a pastry chef and owner of meringue bakery in lacrosse wisconsin 
I was born and raised in Stanley, Wisconsin, and I'm very proud to come from a long line of dairy farmers. So today, I've created a recipe that both celebrates and supports our awesome